This this is a really great turnaround, y'all. Let me get started. So my name is Dante Rush, and I am the city development support administrator. I oversee our project facilitation office. And so what we do is we manage uh, unique and complex projects through our development process. And we also handle the city's pre-development conference meetings. And so this workshop, this was uh, an idea that DJ Harrell, director, came up with. And we took this idea and we worked with all of our development partners to put together this first workshop that we got on the screen today to go over our whole development process. And so I'm gonna turn it over to DJ and he can do an intro on how this came about and what we look forward to getting started. Hey, thanks, Dante. Hey, thanks guys for being here. Uh, like Dante said, my name is DJ Harrell. I'm the Director of Development Services for the City of Fort Worth. And uh, many of you who develop in the City of Fort Worth know that development is complicated. But um, one thing that I want to leave you guys with is you guys are welcome to ask any questions that you may have. Our contact information is in the back. We've provided some QR codes with some useful tools on how to navigate the development process. Um, again, we just want to be as helpful as possible, as communicative as possible, on how to deal with us and get through the process. Um, again, I would like to say a huge thank you to our partners in the Real Estate Council, our Development Advisory Committee, uh, our Chambers of Commerce, uh, and you know all of the folks that you know help put this together. And again, I'd like to take, thank you guys for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be here with us and learn about the development process. And also, shout out to the folks who will be watching this later online and trying to get to the development process as well. So thank you. I'll turn it back over to Dante, but thank you guys for showing up. Thank you, DJ. So as DJ mentioned, what you're going to learn today, we're going to go through an introduction to our development process. You're going to meet uh, all of our development partners that are hands-on on your process. You're also going to look at our different useful tools and resources. Now, one thing we want to do to make sure that this is not only a meaningful workshop now, but for the future ones, is in your handout, you've got a QR code to what you see on the screen. So during the presentation and afterwards, we welcome all your comments, questions, and feedback so we can program the next one to meet your needs. So if it's something related to remodeling, certificate of occupancy, or platting, whatever it is, we want to know what it is so the next one meets your needs. So the way the presentation will work today is we've got it broken down into three parts shown on the screen here. We're going to offer two breaks in between these segments. These will be about 10, 15 minute breaks. And a piece of property he inherited from some relatives. And what he's going to do is he's going to take a greenfield site. So this is a site that has never been developed before. And he's going to turn it into a new 20,000 square foot facility that 10,000 square feet will be for his bistro and 10,000 square feet for a future tenant that he'd like to make some rental income off of and also has several large caliber trees on site. So take note of that because that will be relevant as we walk through our process, looking at what his existing property has in terms of characteristics physically, but also the existing entitlements for zoning. So getting started, this is our due diligence phase of Bob's project. Get started, is he's going to go through and enter our development services homepage. And so on this homepage, he's going to find a few useful tools and resources to get started on all of his due diligence. Now, also, he's going to locate on our City of Fort Worth homepage our business services portal. And this is a new portal we've just recently created in collaboration with our partners in our economic development department. This lists financial incentives that are offered for his project. But also, if Bob wants to go big in the future after this bistro and maybe add on and expand his empire with some small finish outs of his bistro, he's going to find a CEO guide for restaurants that we put together for the city of Fort Worth. Bob's also going to find several useful mapping tools that we have available on our website. The first one is called CFW Permit Assist. The second one is one address, our zoning annexation viewer, as well as our flood risk viewer. Now what each of those are is permit assist is a tool that allows you to look at your land use permissions for a property. So Bob can go in and type in 
if his bistro is allowed at the address. And what it's going to do is it's going to populate different color segments in the city, showing if it's approved, or if it's allowed, if it's conditionally allowed, or if it's not allowed. He's also going to be able to type in into the permit scope tool the anticipated permit fees for his bistro. Now, one address, that is a mapping tool that showcases different neighborhood information, such as uh, crime and code violations. The Zoning Annexation Bureau allows Bob the ability to look at different mapping layers, such as his council districts, city boundaries, economic development areas. And then the Flood Risk Bureau allows Bob to look at non-FEMA floodplain areas that he can see if they have any flood risk for his future project planning. So back to permit assist, so when Bob types in his bistro, so Bob was zoned agriculture. Now, permit assist helps Bob uh, understand that on this piece of property, restaurant is not allowed, and it's gonna explain to him that he needs to do a zoning change. Bob also finds online some useful manuals and ordinances. Specifically, we have our commercial development guide, we have our stormwater design manual, our transportation engineering manual, and our water and wastewater manual. This is our commercial development guide. Um, in the handout, you'll see a QR code so you can scan it and use it on your phone. What else should Bob prepare for? So Bob would benefit by doing a public information request. And so what Bob will gain by doing this is he'll get as-built drawings on the existing infrastructure adjacent to the site so he can work with his design team to prepare for his future civil submittals. Now Bob is feeling pretty savvy. He's done his due diligence using all of our different resources and he's ready to use our next resource which is our pre-development conferences. So as I mentioned, our project facilitation office, we hold the pre-development conferences in the city of Fort Worth. We do 10 a week. These are roughly 30 minutes to an hour. And Bob locates this PDC option within his commercial development guide, and he decides that this would be a great boon to his project, and so he reaches out to the facilitation office to book a PDC. So why should Bob schedule a PDC? So Bob and his design team, they're going to work with our subject matter experts on our city staff to help with his project planning. Now this is an optional meeting, that we, so we don't require it, but it is a, a great item that we recommend everyone to utilize, but especially Bob because he's new to this. So those staff that are in attendance of the PDC meetings, are those shown on the screen? So these help with all aspects of site design, so layout of, of fire lanes, layout of utilities, uh, zoning permissions, your parking permissions that relates to zoning, transportation impact fees. These groups are there to help Bob and you, the audience, figure out what he needs to do to prepare for his future submittals. So how does Bob schedule a PDC? So he can reach out to the facilitation office, but he can also go online to our pre-development conference webpage, which is found on the development services homepage. So he's going to download the PDC application. He's going to sketch a site plan for his bistro. Now on the site plans, these do not have to be professionally drawn, but the more information you can give us, the better it is to get you the best feedback from our staff. But we will take sketches to help you and facilitate your timelines to help you move forward as quickly as possible. Now when Bob's prepared his site plan, he's going to email that to our project email shown on the screen and that's gonna help us nail down his PDC date. So we host PDCs Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, one to two on Mondays, three to four on Tuesdays, and then nine to noon on Thursdays. So Bob has two options, a 30 minute PDC, which is free, or he can do a one hour PDC, which is $250. How does Bob's PDC meeting operate? So we host all PDCs online using WebEx. Now Bob and his team will accept the invite, he'll join, and he will showcase his project to open the meeting, and then staff will convey their comments to him to help him with his future submittals. 
So how did Bob benefit from his PDC meeting? So Bob obtained a wealth of information in his PDC. So number one, he is not in proximity to a gas well pad site. He is also within an active transportation impact fee service area. The property is not located within a special zoning overlay district. Bob figures out that he will actually, excuse me, Bob will meet his zoning case planner to handle his zoning application change for the bistro. Bob is provided insight that he'll need a minor final plat, but also with that, he's going to need to have all of his studies approved before he submits his minor final plat. He will also need a grading permit, he'll need an urban forestry permit, and the building will need a fire sprinkler system. So Bob leaves the PDC, he's feeling really good, and he is now ready to meet his zoning case planner, Mr. Stephen Murray. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Murray, and I'm representing the zoning team uh, and my wonderful staff. So Bob just realized, well, he's known for a little while, that he has to go through the zoning change process. Now, you can go ahead and put the next slide, Dante. Uh, he has a slew of zoning uh, categories that he can choose from, but he's going to choose E because he's kind of close to a neighborhood, and he wants to be kind of neighborhood friendly. Next slide. So the zoning change process is a two and a half to three month process. And before Bob even submits his zoning application, he's going to go and talk to the neighborhood associations that are surrounding his property. He's also going to maybe make a call to the council member just to let them know that this might be coming down their way. So again, I want to make that uh, really clear because we get this a lot in um, public hearings. Did you talk to the neighborhood? They're going to ask the applicant, did you talk to the neighborhood? So please, before you submit your zoning application, we have a neighborhood database. Please find who your neighborhood is, and our office will be happy to assist. And talk to that neighborhood and let them know, hey, I'm Bob. I'm about to put a new restaurant here. What do y'all think? So get neighborhood buy-in prior to submitting that application, because it's kind of like a mini fatal flaw analysis. They're going to tell you, that neighborhood association, if they're going to support what you're proposing or not. So that's kind of the first thing you do. So the zoning change process, like I mentioned, it's a three month process to submit your application. Then you go before the zoning commission once uh, you're slated to go to that hearing. It's a public hearing process, so you'll go to the zoning commission. Now the zoning commission is a recommending body. They make the recommendation to city council. Once you go before the zoning commission, you'll get your recommendation. You'll go through that public hearing process. Then you'll go to city council for a final determination. Uh, the City Council will listen to the Zoning Commission recommendation, listen to any uh, neighborhood input, they'll get correspondence from uh, property owners within 300 feet, they'll take all that information, they'll, they'll look at our staff report that we, we provide, and they'll make that final determination. So th there's where we are with the two and a half, three month process. Now, after he gets his zoning, Bob needs to consider a few other things, and, and a lot of these things were also already mentioned to him during the pre-development conference. He needs to understand what his building setbacks are. He needs to understand that in e neighborhood commercial and for a restaurant, that you have to provide 10% of the net side area for landscaping. Um, he also needs to know that he's allowed by right a monument sign, and that for parking, you are required to provide one space for 100 square feet for that restaurant area. And as far as the other 10,000 square feet, that, that will be dependent on what he decides to do. So Bob needs to make, be aware of his parking regulations as well. So uh, if Bob is in a historic district, he'll also need to get a certificate of appropriateness. So all those things Bob needs to uh, consider after he gets his approved zoning. And I think that's all I have. I'll have Shad here afterwards to uh, answer any questions regarding zoning. Thank you, Stephen. So after Bob meets Stephen Murray, he's going to work with Caleb Olson and work on his urban forestry plan. Are the other mics live at the moment? They were trying to pass one off. Good afternoon, everyone. 
My name is Caleb Wolfson. I'm the senior plans examiner on the urban forestry team. So Bob found out in the PDC that he's going to need to get an urban forestry permit. So we'll go ahead and go through that process here. Um, he has a couple of trees on site. He'll need to be removing some of them to do what he wants to do on his property. And he's going to need a building permit as well. Um, that means that he'll need to apply for an urban forestry permit. And when you apply for an urban forestry permit, you're going to be applying for both the phase one and the phase two of the permit. Um, the urban forestry permit and some additional guidance on like Excella and the calculations and all that can be found on our webpage, which is on the development services site. And Bob's going to pay a $250 base application fee. Since it's projects less than five acres, it's just going to be the 250 base. Um, the application is going to be submitted in Excella. And that permit fee is going to cover his phase one and phase two plans and also his first set of provisions. So what needs to be included in his phase one plan? The phase one plan is your existing conditions for the site and what you're going to do with it. So he'll need to show his existing tree canopy. He mentioned he had a couple large trees on site. He'll need to show where those are located. And he'll also need to provide the total canopy area that's on site. Bob will also need to take a look and see if he has any significant or large trees. If there, once he shows his existing trees, he's got to show if they're being preserved and how they're being protected or if they're being removed. Um, urban Forestry has a check on the grading permit applications. You need that phase one plan to get past urban forestry for those. So moving to the phase two plan, the phase two is going to be the proposed conditions and what the site's going to look like when everything's done. It's going to include include all the structures he's building, any parking, um, the existing trees he saved, and any new plantings he's doing. So Bob's a commercial development. His base land use requirement is 30% provided canopy area. And there's also a sub requirement of 40% for his on-site parking and drives. The canopy is prorated based on the species of tree you're planting. 30% sounds like a whole lot of canopy area for an acre and a half. But when the three inch trees, if they're a large species tree, you get 2,000 square feet of canopy credit for that. So the 30% isn't nearly as scary as it sounds. All right, so once Bob has his approved phase two plan, he's pretty much done with the urban forestry process. But these are some things to keep in mind as he's going through the permitting process. So like I said, um, the planted canopy is prorated based on the species. We have three different size classifications. Large is 2,000 square feet, medium 700, small is 100. And then to get his building permit approved, they were going to be doing an urban forestry check. So for him to get through building permits, he's going to need an approved phase two urban forestry plan from us. And then once he has that, he should either submit it with his building permit application, or if he's already sent his building permit application in, once he's got the approved phase two plan, go ahead and toss that in Excel as well. All right, throw back to Dante. So that is part one, but we want to offer up the opportunity to do some Q&A before we go into this first break. So we're going to run around with some mics. Uh, by a raise of hands, who has some initial questions on this first segment? Do you offer the PDC um, in like Spanish or is it only in English? Do you have any other languages that people may be able to do that with? So we, we have bilingual staff that are, we have one on our facilitation office, so we can, we can help accommodate that as much as we need to. I had an approved permit uh, before the pandemic, and because the pandemic, you know, uh, we couldn't build it. Uh, is there any way that I can get this thing renewed because everything is the same? Uh, nothing's changed except for just the time elapsed. So, so let's let's take that one afterwards, and we're, let's let's connect afterwards, and we'll look at the details, and we'll figure that out for you. What was your name, sir? Shiraz. Okay. Yeah. Let's connect afterwards, and we'll get the information from you. Oh, and DJ's card is in the back as well, but we'll connect with you on that. Uh, so that canopy rule applied to only land more than one acre or any 
next slide. So the 25% preservation requirement is only for sites that are an acre or greater. So if Bob was building on 0.75 acres, he wouldn't have a preservation requirement. Uh, but even if you're less than an acre, you still do need to mitigate for remove significant trees. He just wouldn't need to preserve 25% of his canopy. Order? Stephanie's going to bring Mike over for you. Thank you. So, um, can you can you kind of give one more definition of what a canopy credit is? And let's say you have a twenty-five percent tree preservation requirement. Can you remove all the trees and then plant new trees? And will those trees count as your canopy credit? I just I, I didn't understand that canopy credit concept. Yeah, no problem. So it's two different set of requirements. The 25% preservation is just of your existing canopy. We, the ordinance for urban forestry, there's no method to plant in the loop of preservation. You have to meet that 25% preservation requirement if you're greater than an acre. Um, if you can't, you can apply for a certificate of appropriateness through UDC, but that's a pretty long process and it's not always a guarantee. So the best bet is always to preserve your 25. The canopy credit I was talking about is when new trees are being planted. So we have a list of approved species for the city. Um, they're classified by size, so you can see the credit you're getting. Like a new live oak, it's going to be three inches caliper. It's going to be just a little ball of a tree, but it's 2,000 square feet of credit because you're planting it as part of, of an approved phase two plan, and it's one of those approved species. So you'll get prorated canopy for your new plantings. Um, we don't prorate canopy for existing trees unless those trees were planted as part of a previously approved phase two plan. How do you determine the canopy credit that's needed like for your size of development? How, how does that determine the So there's a calculations worksheet in our application. Um, there's a whole bunch of different things, but the general thing is that you get your net urban forestry area. That's just going to be the gross area of your size minus any deductible areas like easements, stuff like that. Um, once you have your net urban forestry area, then you get a percentage of that, which is based off your land use. So Bob's commercial, so he needs to plant 30% of his new fub. That needs to be his final provided canopy. For industrial, it's 20. Um, single family residential, it's 40. New subdivisions, 25. All those requirements are in the calculations that he'll do when he's going through his application. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate that we're following Bob through the process. Is there a way to be approaching both of these at the same time, or do you have to wait until you finish the first phase on the zoning to be able to then do the canopy and urban forestry portion? Like, can some things be happening simultaneously to save some time or get ahead? Run concurrent? Yes. Stephen, specifically, we can let, we can let people pursue From, from a zoning perspective, whenever you switch your zoning application, it'll rezone both properties. So we won't have an issue with zoning. From an uh, urban forestry perspective, what do you think, Caleb? Like, let's say, can they submit an urban forestry plan for the overall site? Yeah, so the only, yeah. The only thing they're going to get caught on. <coughs> Get my steps in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so for urban forestry, we can send that in. We're normally one of the first applications people send in. Um, you're not going to get caught on anything for urban forestry other than we can't approve the phase two plan until you have an approved recorded plan. That's the only thing that urban forestry is really waiting on. Everything else you can kind of do at the same time and we'll be able to move all the way up until that point in our application. Yeah, and I think running other items concurrently we can kind of talk about it as we get through because zoning is kind of the foundation of the project and once you have your zoning <coughs> You're really only concerned about like the setbacks, the the urban forestry and things of that nature. But there are other factors that we're going to consider further on in our presentation that might help help you get a better idea. Which plot approval would that be? You said which plot approval do you need in the phase two? So for the phase two, 
we'll need an approved recorded flat. Okay. And yeah, we'll just do that so we can verify the size and the locations of easements. Um, first of all, thank you guys for doing this. This is extremely helpful. With all the development that's coming to Fort Worth, have you guys noticed that there's been a wait time with the pre-development conferences? And if so, what does that wait time look like? So we are booking four weeks out. And so I've been with the city for a year and we've actually cut that time down from, it was about six to eight weeks. And we will do whatever we can to get people in for PDCs to help with timelines. So. Um, Four weeks is what we're booking, but if something comes up, I'm, I'm the lead on that team, so I'll figure out a way we can get, get you comments to help with any timelines that are pending. Yeah, so, so we've, we vet applications to look at criteria such as, you know, tie timelines. Uh, we look at what you submit and we'll provide feedback to say, hey, like, hey, you know, if you need to give us more information, we'll give you feedback. So again, we get the best information in for the PDC meeting to get you the best comments back from our staff. Hey y'all, I haven't been up here yet, but I just had to get on stage. Uh, I'm Jennifer Roberts, and one of the things about the PDCs that's really great about our vetting process is if you come to us and you think, I really just have a question on zoning, part of our, what we do in the vetting process is actually say, you know what, you actually just need to talk to someone in zoning. Let's connect you with that person. And that's part of the way that we were able to bring down those PDC times, because we don't want to book you for a meeting four weeks out for something that you could address with a phone call. So Dante and his team do a great job at trying to help our customers get their answers better, faster, funner. So, not to be outdone by, by Jennifer. <laughs> so, also along those lines, right, we do offer consultations, right? So, you don't have to schedule a full PDC if you have a simple question. You go to our website, and on our website, you'll find queue lists where you can place yourself, uh, set an appointment to talk to staff. We can do it by a, a WebEx, by a phone call, or by an uh, in person visit to the city hall. So, you know, there's options you know, outside of PDC to get those quick questions answered. And, uh, you know, the thing that we'll send out will include how to get those consultations being set up. But I think there's also flyers in the back that have a QR code linked to it. Do we have any additional questions for part one? So PDC is the first step or there is a neighborhood approval required like uh, near south side or those uh, different neighborhood we need to go through that approval before PDC so you can do that simultaneously so PDC is optional and part of our process you could say that is a first step uh, meeting with our staff but again as we mentioned we, we offered other opportunities to do vetting consultations even before PDC but yeah um, near south side you can you can have those conversations pre PDC same time as PDC. Anything else? Well, let's take our first ten minute break. So it's just at, it's about twelve thirty. So if everyone come back at twelve forty, we will go into part two. All right, everybody. Let's go into part two. Give it one second. It's pretty fun so far. I mean, this is a this is a great event. We've done a lot of planning, as DJ mentioned, with our staff and all of our development partners. So. I think at the tail end of this, we're gonna we're gonna learn a lot about what we can do on our next workshop. All right, well, we're gonna go into part two, and we're gonna lead off with transportation development. We've got Assistant Director Ty Thompson, and he's gonna showcase how Bob is gonna work on his transportation planning for the site. Thank you. 
I really appreciate everybody coming out because it is very important that we talk about how to do the very basics of development because everybody's involved in it. And you also need to know who you need to talk to. So Bob's decided that he's going to create a bistro and he's going to need, he's going to provide a copy of his plat to transportation development service or uh, transportation development review. Now TDR is our transportation group within development services. And what they do is they determine if you need a traffic impact analysis. Now, if you need a traffic impact analysis, what that's basically going to tell you is you're going to have to do a study. So have any of you ever seen those hoses laid across the road and you're driving down the highway? And it, yep, you've seen them? That's somebody taking traffic counts and they take left turns and right turns and all the good stuff that's associated. And then an engineer takes all that information and compiles it, pulls it together and says, you need a left turn lane here, or you need to put a signal, or you just need a decel line, or you don't need to do anything at all. We just were checking to make sure that there wasn't any additional impact to the existing region. So that's what a traffic impact analysis is. That's what we review. And that's how we know that we're not making an impact on the system that can't handle it because of Bob's Bistro. <clears throat> With that, he also does uh, a lot more, which is circulation studies. Those are also part of the traffic impact analysis. Uh, we do a lot of communication uh, with Bob because we want to make sure Bob doesn't go out, hire an engineer, and then do a bunch of analysis that's not necessary or really doesn't provide any impact to what we're trying to accomplish. So Bob should talk to Tom similarly, who is the head of transportation development review. And by doing so, he'll be able to pinpoint exactly what the area of study needs to be. That will save everybody a lot of money. Plus, you may find out you don't need to study at all. So that, that's always good stuff. Um, if you do have to submit a study, we take 10 days to review them and we turn them right around. And typically, that's with your traffic engineer. Um, so again, you need to hire an engineer in the state of Texas that re that's registered. And uh, they, they will prepare that information for you. Bob is not an expert, but this is a really important endeavor for him, so uh, he, needs, he needs to hire experts to take care of it for him. All right. I wouldn't say any questions, but we're not allowed to do that until the very end. Um, he's so strict. <laughs> um, stormwater. Now, everybody has had a problem with stormwater at least once in their life. Uh, whether it shut down the road for you or hopefully it never flooded your property. But that's one of the things that we take care of in development services is we try to do our very best to make sure that any development has no adverse impacts either to upstream or downstream, which basically means to their adjacent properties. Their adjacent properties. Um, one of the big things that we like to do is sit down with you. At, we call it a PDC stormwater. Uh, meeting. It's pre-development conference uh, and it's just solely focused on stormwater and what we do is we sit down, we go over your area and we look at what we call the zone of influence. Now the zone of influence means you take that study all the way down to some portion and we know you're not going to impact your neighbors and that makes everything great and we give you a letter that says it's a drainage study uh, acceptance letter and you get to move on into platting. Um, we also look at your IPRC plans which we'll get into a little bit but that's actually the, the storm sewer, the culverts, and roadways that you typically drive over. So anything that's developer-led in the city of Fort Worth goes through this stormwater group that's related to stormwater. So all these new roads that you see getting built aren't all coming out of TPW. They're, a lot of them are coming out of development services. All right. This, oh, um, a grading po uh, permit. So. Not everybody needs a grading permit, but a lot of people do. Now, what's a grading permit? That is your ability. You're telling the city that this is what you plan to do with all the dirt. So you've got a piece of property as God made it, and you're going to go in there with a bulldozer, and you're going to tear everything up, and you're going to put it to some uh, elevation so that works for your development or for Bob's development. And in doing so, we want a permit. <clears throat> we want you to provide us with the permitting information uh, which is a grading plan. Uh, typically, that also involves your erosion control and any other stormwater related stuff. So we know exactly what your runoff is. Again, making sure you're not uh, causing impact to your neighbor. And in doing so, we then will give you, you also have to go through uh, 
the Parks and Recreation, Water Department, Stormwater Development Services, Environmental, and Urban Forestry. And all those sections actually determine whether or not you're going to get a permit or not. Trust me, it sounds a lot worse than it really is, I promise. Um, do you need a stormwater study or not? If your property is bigger than an acre, you need a stormwater study. Just point blank. Now, if it's less than an acre, but it's in an area that we feel like it could be potentially, we have the right to ask you for a study, and that's only to protect you as well as your neighbors. But typically, anything under an acre, we don't require a study. Next slide. Water and wastewater. This is always a good topic. In engineering fun, don't you love these topics? I mean, it's this is the perfect thing after lunch. Um, so again, you need a registered Texas engineer to pre prepare a water wastewater study. Um, that study for Bob's Bistro could just be a loading table, which is what his demand is. So his demand is uh, so much water that he uses per day for operating his uh, restaurant. And then so much of that water gets into the wastewater pipes after we're done. So that is simply something that you would submit to the water department or through the water development section. And we would actually determine, yes, that's enough water. Yes, that's the right meter size and move on. Sometimes you need to do a little bit bigger study. And that study typically, what we try to do again is sit down with you and meet so that you understand exactly what the limits of your study should be. And we go through that in, in great detail. That's a little bit more advanced, but probably well outside what Bob is trying to do right here. Um, his engineer is going to make that determination and will work with our engineers so that you guys aren't spending money you don't need to be spending. Now I'm done. Um, so when he does his water and wastewater, Bob's going to demonstrate that his bistro uh, has the proper civil design. So that means he's going to show where the public sewer and water and wastewater lines are. And in doing that, it's in the public right away. So every, I, we don't really focus on the private side. It's not that we don't care. We just don't focus on that because what we do care about is anything you dedicate to the city. Because after two years, we own it. That means we have to go in there and dig it up and we have to take care of it if something goes wrong. Um, so we wanna make sure you do it right the first time. We wanna make sure you're never out of service and we wanna make sure that you're in service for a very long time. And to do that, that's why we sit down and we have your engineer prepare engineering plans and we review, review those with you. All right, the very last thing, infrastructure plan review center. Now this one is a little different because what happens is they act as the project managers for all privately led development in the city of Fort Worth. Okay, what happens is all these engineers get together after they do their studies and they put together a set of plans. We call them construction documents and they give them to IPRC. They come in one day and they just submit and say, hey, Vic here, Vic T Tenero, who is not here, but he's, he's the guy who oversees it. He's my engineering manager. Uh, great guy. You, you'd love him. Ask him to lunch. He won't go, but that's fine. He's uh, anyway. Uh, he will take your plans and then we have other PMs, other senior PEs and PEs uh, that actually go out and actually uh, review what you're looking at. So they coordinate with your different departments, whether it be the water section, stormwater or traffic, could be with the water department, could be with tra transportation public works, might be with parks, might be with legal. All those things are done internally through this department. And their, bit, their goal is to get you in and out so that we can get dirt flying, get your business going, and you guys are making revenue. That's our end state, okay? I know sometimes it comes across differently when they say no, but truly development is our, pro our, our, our passion. And that's the one thing that we want to make sure all of y'all know, even when they say no, there's a yes in there, you just gotta keep asking. <laughs> and if you don't, come see me and I'll make sure we find the yes together, all right? <laughs> that's everything I've got. Oh, there's one more slide. You can read that for yourselves, I guess. Todd, do you want to go over anything on the CFA eligibility? No. Oh, CFA eligibility, yes. CFA Express. 
I'm sorry. Uh, I read too far ahead. So the CFA Express is really uh, uh, something for just what Bob needs. And the reason why that we created this program is because it takes a six to eight week process and takes it down to 24 days. And so the CFA Express is for very small jobs using very small utilities, and it's meant for small scale design development. And our, our goal is not only to get you in and out quickly, but to get you in and out through your contracts and get you executed so that you're ready to go. Um, if we go the standard route, uh, that takes a little bit longer. and It's usually a much more robust project. So we're talking single family development, stuff like that. But for Bob's Bistro, it's the perfect avenue. Now, what he does need to do is he needs to contact Vic Tornero and he needs to contact Debbie Wilhelm and sit down with them and find out, am I eligible and will I get into the CFA Express pro uh, program? They'll take a look at the evaluation, then they'll make a call and then let you know that you're in the system. We sit down the very first time with you and your engineer, we go over your plans, and then you leave, your engineer takes those plans, makes those comment revisions, and the next time he comes in, hopefully that is it's a final set of plans and we're going straight to pre-construction. So that's something we came up with after speaking with the development community because we felt like that was the best way to address these smaller jobs. Now I'm done. And uh, the staff mentioned we have city contacts listed in this slideshow. So you'll have a link to meet Vic and Debbie as, as Ty has prefaced. All right, so after IPRC, Bob gets to meet Becca Owen and her contracts office team. Hey guys, I'm Rebecca Owen. I'm the manager of the contract management office and all the good work that Ty just told you guys about, they are going to send over to my office and we're gonna bake that into contracts for you so that you guys can get rocking and rolling on your project. So Bob actually, um, the IPRC team called out and said, oh, he needs a public access easement for this park nearby. So we have two land agents in contract management. And what we'll do is work with um, uh, internal staff and with you guys. We will get warranty deeds, things like that, signature authority. And we will come up with a draft, which we will go back and forth with you guys. And then we will route, execute, and record with the county um, as applicable. OK. One more. Sorry, I think I skipped one. Oh, okay. So Bob, uh, with his bistro, he really wants it to look a certain kind of way. He wants it to be aesthetic. He wants to have large fl flower pots in the right of way, and there's nothing wrong with that. All we need to do is an encroachment agreement. So we have project assistants who will work with you guys and um, obtain the necessary information and file, um, again, I'm sorry, route, execute, and file with the county, record with the county, the encroachment so that... Um, this can remain in the right of way with no issues. Now, IPRC is gonna call out all of the infrastructure improvement needs that uh, Bob needs to be able to tie into our water, um, if he needs to pave any of the streets, storm drains, things like that. We're gonna get that information from IPRC and we're gonna bake that into the contract. We're gonna secure it with a, finan a financial guarantee, route it and execute it so that everybody knows exactly what was agreed upon this contract will stay in place until the end of the project. Once the uh, infrastructure is approved and accepted by the city, um, it will be green sheeted and we will release your financial guarantee and you guys will be ready to move on to go vertical. And as Ty just mentioned was that um, you guys all know this, as soon as you go into grading, as soon as you start you know, leveling the land, we're gonna have issues with the stormwater, right? So we have stormwater facility maintenance agreements and what this does is if it's not ours, if it's something that um, the developer needs to take care of, we put together a contract and it basically just outlines the fact that it is in fact your responsibility. It just clearly defines what needs to happen and the contract does carry with the land. So even whenever you sell the property, the contract will still be valid. Now Bob, he really wants this bistro to look a certain way. He really wants a specific type of lighting along the front of his business, which the city does not offer. We don't have contracts for that sort of thing. It's not standard. Um, again, that's not a problem. We can do that. We can do a maintenance agreement. He can put in uh, the infrastructure that he likes and he has to maintain it. No problem. He can have the aesthetic um, you know, look that he likes and everything can go on its way. We will just bake that into a contract, execute it and have it on record so everybody knows exactly who is responsible for maintaining this infrastructure. 
Easy peasy. Thanks, Becca. No problem. So Bob's going to meet Lynn Jordan to go over his minor final plat submittal. Okay, thank you, Dante, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lynn Jordan. I'm the senior planner with the Platting and Annexation team, and I'm going to go over some uh, platting uh, with Bob. So now that Bob's had his PDC and he's ready to, he's been told he has to submit for a minor plat, which is an NFS. And the reason why he has to submit for a final plat is because we want to make sure he has public adequate facilities. Um, and the, fin the final plat will ensure that. Um, and of course, he through all the information that you've already heard from, water, sewer, stormwater, transportation, all that will come up during that time. Okay. So Bob, what qualifies Bob for a final plat? So a final plat is four lots or less. And there's no uh, street dedication, so he already has public. He already has access. Okay, and so there are, there are several types of plats for those that you may not know. So we have concept plans, we have preliminary plats, we have final plats that follow preliminary plats, we have replats that come about after a final plat has been um, submitted, and then we also have the minor final plat. Which, which is what Bob is doing. And the reason why I mentioned the preliminary plat, should Bob at some time decide before he gets to moving forward that he wants to break his lot up into two lots and he wants to sell it off or he wants to develop it in another phase, he would go through that preliminary plat process. Okay. So once, all, once Bob has submitted for his final plat application, he's ready, he's had his PDC, he's submitted his zoning application, it's been accepted. He's submitted his CFA, it's been accepted. He's got his three study letters that are required. He's ready to submit his application into a seller. Okay. So, um, so Bob's final, minor final plat, sorry about that, um, approval. So it can be approved administratively as long as there are no um, waivers required from the City Planning Commission. Um, and uh, per, the, per chapter 212 of the Texas Local Government Code, uh, plats shall be approved conditionally or disapproved within 30 days. Okay, so uh, what does Bob do after his final plat is approved? The, once his uh, CFA has been executed, Bob is ready to get signatures on his plat and get his plat recorded. He'll be ready to, once his plat is recorded, um, the plat will go to the fire department, he'll get his address, and he can go move forward with pulling his billing permit. Okay, all right, thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Now we've got Mr. David Hood from our fire prevention team. Good afternoon. So your plat's gonna come through the fire department twice. It'll hit uh, fire department platting the first time, and what we do, uh, we start analyzing your site plans if your plat has access with a public road that's already existing or if you need to dedicate new roads. We're going to measure hose lays. We're going to make sure all your street names are correct or if you need new street names. We check gas well setbacks to make sure you're not in a hazardous zone or building in a hazardous zone. And then points of access for your particular project. When you're building and you say you have a large lot that's got five lots on it, you're going to be doing a preliminary and a final plat at that point. We'll approve new roads to make sure that each lot has access. And as you go through that, we'll also look at the buildings, what kind of hose lays they have, whether or not they're going to need fire protection systems, which will go through our fire protection engineer to verify that as well. As you're looking at hose lays for the building, there's two different hose lays that have to be met. One is from a fire hydrant, and those vary depending on your project. And then you also have to meet from a public roadway or a fire lane. And again, those will vary based on your project. <clears throat> those are also going to factor in whether or not there is a fire protection system in the building. Uh, the distance to the nearest hydrant is factored. There's multiple distances that have to be met, depending on if there's a sprinkler system as well, what, what kind of hazards are in your building, and what your proposed use is. Uh, Say you need new street names. All those are going to be sent through my department. What we do is y'all send a list of proposed street names. We review them, make sure they are not duplicated within the city or any of our adjacent cities where we have ETJ 
Um, we also make sure they're appropriate, and then we send you back the list of what's approved, what's not approved. Those names are held for one year and reserved for your project. After one year, they can be used by another project. Um, so keep that in mind as you move forward. All right. All right. Thank you. Now back, back to the PDC, Bob understood that he's in a transportation impact fee service area and he's gonna be provided Jennifer Roberts and she's gonna walk Bob through how to calculate his impact fees. All right, uh, as Dante said, my name is Jennifer Roberts. Let's take a trip down the transportation impact fee route. So, what should Bob know about transportation impact fees? So these are assessments to cover the costs associated with public transportation or of infrastructure improvements due to new development. And there's a little bit you need to know about the timing, um, the invoicing and the payment, and then we'll cover calculation on the next slide, but hold on a second, Dante. All right, so we assess them based on your final plat, and that's the approval date of your final plat, not the recordation date, because sometimes it takes a few days, so we wanna lock it in as soon as we can. So what does that mean to you? What we're trying to do is establish what study your development falls under. So we update our transportation impact fee study every five years, and we do minor amendments every year and a bit or so. So what we want to do is we want to understand what is the maximum assessable rate that we could charge you under state law. Good news is we don't charge you that, but we need to know what it is. Then what we'll do is we'll talk about your collection rate. So that is determined or your schedule two when your building permit application is accepted. So not when we actually issue that permit to you, but when it's accepted. So when you've delivered all the fun things to us so that we're actually able to start the process of reviewing your permit. So we call that schedule two. Now the last thing you need to understand, or Bob needs to understand about the transportation impact fees is that they need to be paid before the building permit um, is issued, right? So there's a couple of different timelines that we need to be thinking about. So, how does Bob know how much he needs to pay? So we have our calculator. This is on our website, so please check it out. Now, when you get into that calculator, um, it has only a couple fields that you can fill in, which is great, so no worrying about um, messing around with any of the calculations in there. Um, and the things that you'll need to know are your plat approval date, your building permit acceptance date, and what service area, area that you're in. Now you're about to ask me, how do I know that? Way back in the beginning of the presentation, we talked about one address. So you type in either your address or one very near it, and all the information that comes up, it'll tell you what your transportation impact fee service area is. Or you can go into the zoning and annexation viewer, that's our GIS viewer, and you can turn on the layer for transportation impact fees to see where you land. Or you can call us and we'll help you with that if you'd like. Um, oh, and you can also find it in CFW Permit Assist. So we have lots of different ways to find that information for you. So once you have all those pieces of information, you go to our website, you download the estimator, it's an Excel spreadsheet, type all the information in there. Then there's two sections below that, one for residential uses, one for non-residential uses. Uses, sorry. Um, you select what thing you're building, um, how big it is, and off you go. So, in this case, Bob is doing something pretty standard. He's building a shell, and then he's finishing out each side. So the first thing that Bob will do is he will go in for a commercial new building permit, which is lovingly called a PB permit in a cella. I know PB stands for peanut butter, but it's a permit for building. Don't ask me why we did it that way. So, we're gonna do a shell permit at first, and we're gonna charge him the impact fees for the shell, because we don't know the use for the entire property. Bob doesn't even know what the use for the entire property is yet. He just knows he's gonna be building out 10,000 square feet for his bistro, but he hasn't figured out who his neighbor is. So because we don't have a use for the entire property, then we'll just do the permit for the shell and the impact fees for the shell. So here we've got what um, the impact fees will be. So I've assumed that Bob's site is in service area T, which is an active fee service area. And we're gonna use non-residential strip retail plaza. And so it's gonna come up at $363,000. Next slide. So now Bob's come back in, he's got his shell built, he's ready to do his finish out for his bistro. 
So he's going to come in for an occupancy change of use permit, or what we call a PO permit, permit for occupancy. I know there's there's a pattern. <laughs> and so then we're going to start to assess that side of the business. Now Bob has already paid for the shell, right? So we now we know what that use is for that side. So that's how much the use is for that side, but he has already paid. Blinding. Um, he's already paid the 363 for the shell. Half of that value from the new use gives us our final number for the PO permit. All right, Bob has figured out who his neighbor is going to be. It's a dentist. So the dentist is going to come in, and the dentist is going to want to do a finish out for his side as well. Again, another PO permit. So we're doing our occupancy. He's going to tick remodel because he wants his CO. So again, the same kind of thing. We're going to have our use for that half of the structure minus what was already paid for the show for our total of 107.5 for that side of the building. All right, you're like, wow, those are big numbers. Are there any discounts? Yes. And they're located in our ordinance, so uh, chapter 30-173, I think. So we have four different discounts on offer. Our first one is our adequate facilities discount. So this is where the majority of the roads around you have been fully built out to their ultimate capacity, and that's a 50% discount. We have extraordinary investment discount, and these are for the really big sites that bring in lots of, of really um, good, high-paying jobs into our region, so it help with economic development. We have mixed-use multimodal development, where the development diverts traffic from the streets to one of our multimodal options, so um, like a, a rail site, so a station. And then we have a small business discount. So while the small business discount can't be used for new build, such as the shell, it could be used on our PO, so our occupancy permit, depending on the characteristics of that business. And if you want to know if you qualify, definitely give us a call, and we can certainly talk that through with you. I think that's me done. And you too, you get a break. <laughs> Yeah, so our presenters, um, if they could all come up on stage, what we'll do is we'll go into Q&A again. So by a raise of hands on what you just heard, what are some questions we have in the audience? This gentleman in the front. And if you'll state your name, sir. My name is Jerry Barton, Jerry Barton Realtors. Uh, Certain areas of town have areas that don't have to pay traffic impact fees, is my understanding, and I believe that Woodhaven is one of those. Is that correct? So you would not have a traffic impact fee, is that correct? I'm not certain where Woodhaven is or in which service area it's in. 820 and I-35. It, it, it depends. Uh, pardon me, 820 and I-30. <laughs> well, uh, Dante, can we go back a few slides? I think I've got a map. Oh, we took out the map. All right. Um, so, on our website. Uh, yes. <laughs> so if it's an Inez, DJ's doing hand signs. What? Okay. So it's an M or N, but it's in Inez. Yes. So there won't be any impact fees. If the Nez is approved. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so that would go through our. Um, Neighborhood Services Group, and they would determine if the NES is approved. Boy, that's a loaded question. That has to do with all sorts of fun things. Hey, so yeah, for for the NES program, right? So um, certain areas of town are covered in that NES overlay, right? Which basically lays out that these properties are eligible to apply for the empowerment zone, right? So there's one, the application fee and um, uh, entitlement fee deferral, but there's also tax incentives involved in the NES portion of the project. In order to vet the project, Neighborhood Services takes a look at your project and it has to meet certain criteria as far as the increase in property value, a but for test, and some other things to determine whether they will approve it. Yeah. Once you gain that approval, that's what gives you the fee um, deferral mm -hmm. that she's talking about. In addition to that, that's building permits, to, you know, there's some help with water sewer connections and things like that as well. Jennifer, I'm sorry, but was rough proportionality mentioned? 
I didn't mention it, no. Ty? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I didn't mention it either. Would you like me to talk about it for a second? Well, Bob's Bistro, he would be responsible for his rough proportional share, which is your fair share of dollars to the system, the transportation system. Now, Bob picked a site, though, where everything was already built out. So there's no more capacity that needs to be built. So therefore, RP wouldn't apply. Have I confused you yet? <laughs> Our rough proportionality simply is your fair share onto the transportation system. And we want to make sure that everybody in the city, when they come in with their development, is putting their fair share in, back into the transportation system. Is that good? You sh I've talked to you like three or four times about this. You know this. <laughs> with the express CFA process, is there any fees associated with that? And then overall, the development process as a whole, what is a rough estimate, would you say? Have you seen developments go over two years time span? What's what's the longest that you guys have seen or the shortest amount of time timeline-wise? Okay, let me unpack that for just a second. I know, sorry, that was a lot. Yeah, um, so the first question was, how much does the CFA Express cost? So there is a pre-submittal meeting, which is $1,000, and then we charge you $386 per design sheet for review. So if you have a set that's 10 sheets, you owe us 3860 3, bucks. okay? Now, your second question, if you'll, uh, it, when you say, have you seen it go over two years, are, are you talking about the construction or are you talking about the review? No, as in, like, the whole, the timeline as a whole, like, development, whether it's the transportation, going through zoning, going through city council, like, as a whole, from the beginning to the end process, what's the longest that you've seen? Um, well, in, in including construction, right? Yes. Probably, uh, and I, I would, I wasn't here at the city at the time, but I would probably have to harken back to 2008, 9, 10, 11, when there was the Great Recession, where projects were basically put on hold because people ran out of money. So that would extend probably that construction but as far as the processing of the plans and everything, no, I've never seen it go past six, eight months. Sorry, don't mean to grill you. <laughs> can, I, can I add something to that? Yes, please. It absolutely depends on the development. So a hot dog stand versus a $200,000 square foot um, industrial development or commercial development. So, so each development has its own character. They're all unique. And all of our, our guidance and our policies, they fit the 70% projects, right? And so everything else is a, is a tweak, is a, is a little different, is somewhat unique. And, and I would say, you know, for all the entrepreneurs in the room, that's what makes your development so cool, is that they're not just like the one next door or the one across the street or the one across, you know, around the way, right? So, um, I think it would be really hard for us to generalize that because now I'm generalizing all the uniqueness in the room and in the city and trying to boil that down uh, to a timeline. But um, I think there's a lot that we can do to um, expedite the process, such as the express CFAs. Um, our, our PDCs are, are incredibly helpful, specifically as we're trying to get to the, the root of the 30% that's you know very different um, for our, our community. So we would want to partner with you to that, to, to make that as short as possible. And apparently we're not saying the right words because DJ's here. <laughs> Next time I'm going to sit way in the back so I can't get here so easily. <laughs> okay. So I, I think what you're getting at is, you know, how long it typically takes to develop, right? We think about it in a different way. What we do is, you know, every one of these folks and every one of the folks that will talk to you for the remainder of the day has a target turnaround time for getting you answers. So if you submit that plat, right, we've got a target turnaround time to get you those answers. What we don't control is how long it takes you to go and make those revisions and bring it back, right? So we don't tr typically track that time, but when you look at, you know, from start to finish, you know, that, that general question from start to finish, you would have to take into account, like you turned in the plat, we gave you comments within 21 days, you took 
like two months, bef- you know, to make the revisions because we know it takes longer to re- design than it does to review, right? So you have to go and do some other things to get to that next point. But then you came back to the zoning folks and you had to do X, Y, and Z, where we've got a target turnaround time for that. And all those target turnaround times are found on our website. So if you just go to fortworthtexas.gov and type in development review time frames, everything we do and everything that we're talking about today is listed with a target turnaround time. And we produce a newsletter monthly. Uh, it's called the Development Activity Report newsletter um, that lays out how we're doing at meeting those turnaround times. So like for building permits, right, you'll hear from them today. You know, our target is seven day turnaround period time, right? You know, um, you know, that's really ambitious. No other city has that goal, right? And so what we want to do is make sure that we're delivering the best service and we're, you know, aiming at these high goals and trying to achieve them as best we can. Sometimes we miss the mark, but most of the times we're spot on with those turnaround times. I hope that got a, you know, to, to, the, to what you were getting at. Well, and to add to that, I would say just a compliment to you guys, the relationship aspect with the city, with developers, like just doing this itself and having so many tools is huge that a lot of cities, especially 12th large city, doesn't have. And so, yeah, it's been really great to just backstory. I'm from Georgia, transplant, won't say it too loud, go dogs. And um, so seeing the way that you guys do things, I've Oh, that one was for you, Troy. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Okay, I'll stop hogging the mic. Uh, who, el- who else has questions? Hey, um, could you just speak to the differences between a, uh, the process with getting through a PD versus one zoning code to another in a rezone case? So that'll be Shad. I'll have him come up and speak to that. Hello, everybody. Shad Roten, Development Services. So PDs are a little bit more specific. I'd like to say probably generally the best way to describe them is a create your own zoning district, so to speak. So you work off a base zoning district, which our zoning ordinance has regulations. All those are the same for your base districts. PDs, you're kind of starting with the base district and you're tweaking it to fit your specific development. So they're crafted or the general ideas that they're utilized for to tailor to something unique that you may have, whether it's a combination of uses, uh, maybe the site, you need to do some clustering things where you need to alter setbacks. So the process itself is the same as a zoning change. Um, There's just a little bit more that goes to it because it is unique and specific. There's a site plan component with the PD so that's a little more legwork you have to do in the beginning stages Um, and it basically dictates how that development works out as far as building orientation what your parking are what your uses are it's all codified and it's in a mini ordinance that's adopted by council and it becomes the land use document for that property again the process is very similar It goes through the steps, it goes through Zoning Commission for a recommendation, it goes to City Council for ultimate approval. Um, We have those PDs. If you ever see a PD, if you're doing our CFW Assist Portal, you come across PDs, um, we encourage you to reach out to staff. We can give you what those regulations are. Again, they're very specific. They're all usually unique and no one PD is like another. I don't know if that answered your question head on or... There's a site plan approval component with the PD that may not be necessary with the, with the base zoning district. And again, the reason for that is because it's somewhat unique. Did that answer your question? Okay. More questions? Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. It was. Um, Can you state your name and... Yes, Isaac Manning, Trinity Works. Um, So my question, and I apologize if this was already covered, could y'all speak to the differences between a final plat and a minor final plat? Um, Are all plat recorded plats created equal, I guess is my question. So to answer your question, so concept plans and preliminary plats are not recorded. Final plats, replats, minor final plats are recorded. Um, As far as a, a final plat will actually follow a preliminary plat. A minor final plat is property that hasn't been developed, less than four lots, 
And then a final short plat is a replat of a lot that's already been final platted. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, related to storm water, is there any rule of thumb for the detention area? What's the question? Can you repeat that, please? Uh, related to storm water, is there any rule of thumbs that how much space we need to dedicate to detention area? Actually, your detention area is a calculation. Uh, so we don't require that you give us 20% or 50% of your property. We require you to do a study, and from that you determine how many cubic feet or acre feet of volume that you need for your detention pond. So that's a calculation based on you. Um, and you may find that being in, in the proximity of existing stormwater or a creek, you may not need detention at all. So that's something else that could help out a piece of property. And then there's the manual. And then there's the design criteria manual. Thank you. Yeah. So, so that'll give you all the criteria to, to actually come up with the study to determine how much detention you'll need. Um, for early grading where there's floodplain adjacent to the site or on the site, um, what areas are allowed to be disturbed during those grading activities and what kind of things need to be approved so that's allowed? Everything outside the floodplain, you can touch. Okay. Anything inside the floodplain, you cannot touch. We you got to have that floodplain development permit. Are early grading FTPs still occurring? Uh, when you say early grading FTPs, are you talking about – there's no really – no such thing. You have to do a flood study or you have to show that you're creating no rise in the floodplain. And then we issue you a grading permit and a floodplain development permit at the same time. But we don't have early grading in advance of a flood study being approved. Okay. Even if there's, if you have a clomer or, or I'm sorry, a, uh, yeah, a clomer on the side or something. Well, like no, that, if you certainly. have a clomer, you get an FTP, but that's, that's a flood study. Right. So would that allow you to grade inside the floodplain? Yes. Okay. That so the it depends on what your process is. So the clomar would be followed by the lomar. Uh, does anybody know what a clomar is or a lomar? You mean okay, conditional of letter ma of map revision and then letter of map revision. And this is all big stuff that FEMA loves. And so just so you know, if you have your clomar, you can get your FDP because our city floodplain administrator uh, Claire Davis will uh, issue that FDP based off that you, he's approved it and FEMA's approved it, so you're good to go and start your construction. After you do your construction, then you come back with your LOMAR. Thank you. Yep, over here. Uh, Clay Huddleston. So just, this is for Jennifer, just on transportation impact fees. Um, I, I, I misunderstood that calculation. So was that based on the total of the expense for the development that you? Square footage square and footage. use. Square footage. So. Okay, I'm still, so I don't, maybe we could go back to that slide. I know it's like two slides back. So, sure. so all right, so down here, the 289K, what, what is that number right there? So the 289 is the transportation impact fee for the medical dental office. Okay. And, and then I've subtracted from it the amount for the shell that's already been paid. Okay. And, and, they, only get, and they only get the discount of half. Because it's the 10,000 square feet is the dental office over the 20,000 square feet, which was the whole shell. Sure. And how do you how do you get to that 289K? Like how the estimator. The estimator. Okay. Yes. So, so uh, Dante, you want to go back a few more slides? I think it's three slides. Oh, <laughs> that was fast. Okay. <laughs> so if you go to our transportation impact fee website, there's a button on the side for the estimator. And in that... You'll take your three pieces of data, so your final plat date, and let's just say you're estimating, right? So you can put in a proposed final plat approval date, a proposed building permit uh, acceptance date, and you'll know your service area because you've either found it in CFW Permit Assist, one address, you've called us, you've looked at the Zoning and Annexation Viewer. So you'll have all those pieces of information. And then with that, in the body of the spreadsheet, there will be an area for non-residential uses and residential uses. And you use the drop down to pick which kind of use you have. You put in your square footage, and then the magic in the background will then calculate your your impact fees. Okay, that's what I was getting at. I was trying to understand what the base was. The base is like a square footage. Yes, it's sir. not like your total development cost that you guys are trying yep. to track somehow and take a percentage off that. It's no. It's a, okay, it's based on your square footage. Yes, okay. sir. All mm -hmm. right, thank you. And use, yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> How's it going? 
Um, so for large commercial projects, um, when it comes to this transport, large commercial projects that uh, incorporate a lot of phasing, so mm -hmm. it's a million square feet or something, they're going to do a couple buildings and a couple buildings and a couple yes. buildings over eight years. Uh, and you, we're calculating the transportation impact fees. Um, is it calculated for the entire site at one time, or is it the first couple buildings? Because I would see that you know if a part of the impact fees is how much is how much roadway infrastructure is already there, the when you do the first two buildings and there's not as much much infrastructure compared to like the final few buildings eight years later, is this calculated each time you're doing the building, like in each phase? So the scenario you're describing is way more complicated than Bob's Bistro. Okay, yeah. But I'm, I'm going to try it. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and a good example I'm kind of thinking of is like the Meta Data Center up north, mm -hmm. where it's very large scale. They did it over time. There was growth around it during that time. So how was it calculated? Yeah, so... There's, there's a couple of things at play with your impact fees. So when your building comes in, the new build, there will be impact fees, right? right? And so we're going to, and if in the case of like the meta structure, they knew what it was. So it was a big building built, built for a specific purpose. So in the scenario of Bob's Bistro, he didn't know what the whole square footage was going to be used for, right? Mm -hmm. But in that case of the um, of Facebook out there, they know what they're going to use the whole building for. Okay. So in the first permit, which would be the, the umbrella permit, that's one we're going to charge for the whole thing. So it will be the shell and the use because we know what it is all at the same time, okay. right? And then as each subsequent building comes up, then they will have their impact fees. Now, you mentioned infrastructure. So now we get into credit agreements, not on the slides. We'll probably need to do another one of these for that <laughs> specifically. Um, once we start to build infrastructure, then we can actually build up impact-free credit on the land, which then can be used to offset impact fees for future buildings. Okay, okay. So and then going to an start. earlier question of like how long the permitting process took from hey we want to build here to break ground how long did it take for a, a scale of a project of that scale again i, I think i'm going to harken back to dj's answer yeah. so we have our design time or design time, our review times on the website but the design times are fully up to the design teams yeah. and what right. they want to do so you know we have our turnaround times and and we stick to those by and large, I mean, there are a few really weird and wonderful ones, those 5% um, where we might go over, but we endeavor at all times to meet those review times. Okay, cool, thank you. I know that was a cagey answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I don't wanna be like, it takes 47 days. And then you're like, what? <laughs> uh, Samuel Snyder here from KFM Engineering. I have a question for you, Ty, about um, drainage studies. Mm -hmm. um, if we have an approved drainage study for an area that assumes uh, let's say a commercial use, but that commercial isn't getting built out yet, and we come back later uh, to actually put in that commercial. And let's say we're going to add some storm culvert. Do we need to redo the drainage study if it assumes the proper use, or can all of that be handled in like the IPRC plan review and reviewing the storm water? Well, just to slow down for a sec, because so storm water studies don't assume a use; they assume a uh, impervious versus pervious ground and so when you say you're coming back and you're going to add some culverts well that tells me that something changed and you added some more concrete so yes we would want you to go back through i don't know that we do the full-blown thing i mean a lot of that that's why i say reach out to uh this sds engineer or, or give me a call I, i'm happy to take your call and, and talk you through it but uh we need to look at it if you're adding something features that were not part of it before. But if you were two or three years ago and you did this big giant design and then for whatever reason we shelved it and you came back and you said, I'm not doing anything, we'll dust it off, take a look at it and it should still be applicable. Thank you. Some over here. Uh, back to the uh, impact fee calculation. Just for the, the group, it might be helpful. In Bob's scenario where he's landlord and there was a, was it medical office? I believe dental. with dental. He found with, a dentist. What happens if uh, Bob's unable to land that 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 uh, tenant, and it needs to be a you know shell retail or a maybe it's a fast casual? What happens in the scenario when his his use changes, and what does that do to his impact fee calculation? So you're talking about a second finish out. No, his, uh, his medical dental office falls through after the fact, and his finish out needs to become something something else, a change All of right, use. All right, so now we're going to get to um, some nuances for the impact fee study. All right, here we go. If the CO, 
was issued for the dental office. They went in, they built it out, and then the dentist was like, I'm tired of this, I'm moving to Tahiti. And now they're going to a second finish out. There is not impact fees charged on the second finish out. Now, if Bob was like, I really love this dentist, he's awesome, and then, oh, that didn't work out, no CO, no finish out, then the first finish out hasn't actually happened. And then there would be impact fees charged for the actual first finish out of that space. You're looking at me puzzled. I didn't answer your question. I'm sorry. Can I try again? I didn't intend it to be a loaded question. <laughs> I was thinking, see, because what I heard in the second finish out, even if there's a change of use, that there's not an, an additional impact fee. Right. Which would be nice. So, to Shell, uh -huh. Bistro, first finish out on this 10,000 square feet. Dentist, first finish out of this 10,000 square feet. When the dentist goes to Tahiti, somebody else moves in, and then that becomes the second finish out of that 10,000 square feet. And there isn't an impact fee charged for that. Only if it's a medical dental office? No matter what the use is. That's great news. Thank you. <laughs> it's in the ordinance. Uh, Jennifer, I think this is for you as well. Um, okay. Can you go to the slide where you're talking about the discounts for the transportation impact fee uh, under small business discount? Yes, ma'am. I think I know the answer, but new construction does not qualify? Correct. And, and why is that? Because we were targeting our, our burgeoning small businesses that are just starting, um, likely limited on capital, and they're putting all that capital into the finish out, the equipment, the restaurant, the kitchen, the hiring staff. So these are our fledgling small businesses. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. I have a chamber member, and he's actually on his way over here, but um, if he's finding that there's errors with the plats that he's purchase multiple properties and they're wrong and they can't find addresses for some of the residential properties that he's now trying to sell. Who does he contact to try to work through that? The platting, is it the platting? The, the so there's errors on the plats or errors in the addressing? Both. Apparently it's not reading correctly and now he's having problems with the sale part of it. So it sounds like we need to have just a big old meeting. Okay, he's on his way. <laughs> If it's already platted, that's probably going to be a mixture between the fire department and the platting department to confirm some things. I'm in the platting section. Yes, ma'am. What other questions do we have? I'd like to know, uh, there's a thing now, the green infrastructure, is Fort Worth in doing any of that? And if not, could the developer do his own green infrastructure on their property? Ma'am, I think it, so you're looking to do green infrastructure for your site? Yeah. That is a great question. And something that everybody, uh, green infrastructure is something that the city of Fort Worth has discussed in the past. Uh, unfortunately, it's something that is very expensive and the low impact development, which is intended to reduce runoff of the total volume of water, it just hasn't, the technology hasn't gotten there. But we are examining that again through our stormwater management group in t Transportation Public Works. So, but if the developer in uh, wanted to use green infrastructure, absolutely, we would applaud them for doing that because it, it only goes to better the environment. Um, there are some areas that we have actually partnered with in the TCU area and some other places that have done green roofs, rain barrels, uh, different kind of uh, pervious pavements. So yes, we, we have done it in the city of Fort Worth, but it is not a requirement today. Hi, Trevor Mendes with DHI Communities. Um, on the impact fee credits for the large ones what is the kind of like the minimum thresholds for that extraordinary investment discount one more time sorry what's the minimum thresholds on the extraordinary investment discount i don't have them memorized okay. um well, but it. it's um so it's, it's in our ordinance uh chapter 36 and 173 i think sounds about right um it is on our website it's 
quite substantial. If I can grab my phone, I can actually tell you what they are. No, no, I can look it up. Here. Oh, I'm nervous. I forgot. Oh, and then on the stormwater and transportation reviews and things, are those happening concurrently with each? Yes. Group? Okay. That's what. If you submit them concurrently, <laughs> got you on that one. <laughs> Um, whenever you're talking about the stormwater, um, the stormwater uh, pre-development meeting, is that a second pre-development meeting specifically for stormwater, or is that? It is. Okay. So you have your big PDC at 30 minutes or an hour, like uh, Dante had already talked about. This is just for stormwater, and all we do is talk about stormwater and how to get your site up and running. Okay, fantastic. And could you also explain the difference between the CFA and the IPRC? So, okay. Unfortunately, I'm, I combine a lot of things because I talk real fast because I want to impress people. And if I talk slow, you'll figure out that I'm really not that impressive. So Would having said that, us, please? yeah, the CFA process is, we call it a community facilities agreement. And that is our contract that we signed between us and the developer so that we can ensure that we have bonds to pay for financial guarantees to pay for the construction of the project that you've just finished. We call it the CFA process because at the end of IPRC, the uh, infrastructure plan review, you get a CFA. So we, you, it's really, there's no difference. We just, it's the lingo that we use at the city. And I'm, I was going to clarify on the PDCs. So you, neither of those PDCs are required. They can happen independent of each other, one before the other, the other before the one. The so, free. pardon? And they're free. And they're free. So, um, you know, we definitely encourage communication so that we can help you get turned the correct way around as you come into the process. What other questions are out there for part two? Okay, well, we're going to take another 10 minute break. So it's just about 145. So about five to two, we'll reconvene. So welcome to part three. So Bob is now at the phase of his project, he's going to get an address. And he's going to obtain that through our fire team. And we've got Jake, Jake here. Um, Jake, go ahead and introduce yourself. Come on. Well, it's just like he said, my name's Jake. And <laughs> so, so a lot of times Bob will come to my cubicle, because I work in the cubicle now, and he'll ask me, <laughs> yeah. he's like, why am I at the department getting an address? That, that don't make no sense. And so uh, what I'll tell Bob is, uh, back in 1999, the fire department took over addressing. And there was uh, three things going on in the, in the 80s, 90s, before the turn of the century. There was the uh, activation of the enhanced 911 system. There was the use of cell phones. And there was a vision from the city council and the mayor to make Fort Worth the safest big city in America. So as that vision and those two issues trickled down through the departments, uh, Bob Riley, the director of planning and development at the time, reached out to Jim Tidwell, the fire marshal, and asked if the fire department would handle addressing. And so we've been doing that for 24 years. and. At that point, Bob will say, man, that's really cool. Good, glad to know that. But sometimes Bob will say, I really didn't want to know all that. I just need an address so I can get a permit and get on with my life. And so we'll get Bob an address. So Bob's going to need a recorded plat. We're kind of like the urban forestry guys. We want a recorded plat before we give you an address. So there's a few you know, exceptions to that, but it tends to be large planned developments or school districts or low-income housing, but, but for the most part, our policy and practice is to have a recorded plat in hand before an address is issued. And we'll get that from Lynn Jordan's team. She'll send it over to us. We don't like for Bob to bring it to us because sometimes Bob doesn't know what a recorded plat is, but I know Lynn does. <laughs> so kind of a checks and balances thing. And so I'll put an address on that plat, and that address is exclusively for the land, for the plat. It's not for any buildings that Bob may or may not build. And that plat will become the plat directory for all to see uh, going forward. And Bob can use that address to start his 
permitting to, to pull his permit. And then we will review that permit and adjust the address if we need to, depending on the way the building is built. And we can do that several ways. Uh, we, could, we could do an address letter or we can get a site plan. Since Bob's going to have at least one shell and possibly some others on this, uh, we can just build a site plan and put that on the plat directory as well with the addresses that are appropriate for first responder access. And all these different uh, stakeholders and addresses have access to the plat directory and they will be mailed an address letter if that's the route we go with. So everyone will know that these are the addresses. So Bob's not gonna have to call the post office and say, hey, my address has changed, or he's not gonna have to call Encore or TAD either. So, so sometimes things don't move as, move as uh, smooth as we like, and, and Bob wants to get started with some of the reviews. Can you get a temporary address just to get, this, get the ball rolling? And the fire department doesn't issue temporary addresses, but I can send them over to, to the, the customer service side and get a for review only address. And I'm not sure how that process works, but, uh, but they can do it. Darren Buchanan is the guy. I know right where to send you to if that's the way you wanna go. But no permit will be filed. I should say that. It won't be filed without an official 911 address. So you can, you can start your permitting process without the 911 address, but it won't be filed without that 911 address, which will come from me. And I spoke with the lady in the back, and we're going to get that straightened out. <laughs> so so uh, that's, that's my email address. If you have any address and concerns whatsoever, lady in the back, <laughs> that's my email address. And we can get, you, get your address squared away. Great. Thanks, Jake. Now Bob's going to meet Cody when he gets into his building permit submittal and plan review phase. How are you all doing this afternoon? My name is Cody Hughes. I'm the plans exam supervisor of the building reviewers. Uh, does Bob need a building permit for his bistro? The answer is yes. Um, we'll do a full review of the building, electrical, mechanical, and plumbing plans for you within seven business days. Um, you'll also need, he would also need mechanical, electrical, plumbing permits. Some people forget about that. When you're doing electrical, mechanical, and plumbing uh, work, you have to have the permits to do that as well. The building permit does not cover all that. When you, what Bob would need to submit is this is our, on our website. Um, you need a full set of plans. Again, building, electrical, mechanical, and plumbing plans. You'll need a site plan, plat. You'll need injury code documentation um, if you're doing any of that work. For his future, uh, work that Bob is going to be doing. So uh, for that suite that he doesn't have a, a uh, tenant in it yet, if it's going to be the same occupancy type, then you just need a finish out permit. You need a permit for that. If it's a different type of occupancy, then you need to change your use. You need a permit for that and some other, um, other projects that would need permits. But there are some uh, work that does not require a permit that is on our website. It's in our local amendments or the administration amendments, and you can find all the lists there that you do not need a building permit for. Uh, what does your designer design your uh, plans to? It's the 2021 ICC and the 2015 uh, Energy Code, the 2020 Electrical Code, and the 2017 uh, ANSI. Um, if Bob, I think we decided that Bob wasn't going to use the X-Team, but for his future plans and projects, he was going to use the X-Team. The X-Team is basically a, a, what it sounds like, a team of plans examiners that get together with your design team and in one day review the plans, um, address any issues they have with it, and get it out the door the same day. Now, caveat to that, there is a $1,000 um, an hour fee to it. That's a two-hour minimum. You can do it either over WebEx or in person. Um, and you do need everything taken care of pre-development-wise. You need to have everything um, everything you need. Uh, the only thing that can really be addressed in that meeting that day is building electrical mechanical issues. There are some pre-development issues that can be uh, taken care of, but not everything. So just make sure you have everything done before you get with them. 
How do you apply for the X team? It's the exact same way you apply for any other building permit. You just go to Citizens Access. There's a little button or a little, um, really it's just a button where you can click X team application and that will get the permit to Ann Nace. Nace, right, yeah, Ann Nace. She's the head of the X team and she'll contact you and work through getting you scheduled and seeing if X team would be right for you or if you should just go through the normal plan review process. Um, again, these are all the, the things that you need to be have taken care of, whether you're doing the normal plan review or an X-Team plan review. Um, go ahead. Now, what does the actual plan reviewers do? We, we're basically customer service for y'all. We're the plans coordination. So anytime you pull a building permit, it's my team that looks at it at the very end, make sure everybody has signed off on the permits. And if they have not, contact that those sections be like, hey, you need to sign off on this. Um, if you all have a citizen's access account, you can see that workflow where everybody will say corrections required or has not answered or whatever it is. My team actually goes in there and makes sure everybody addresses their holds and comments. Um, like I said earlier, we do building electrical mechanical reviews. And we also have a thing that's now for the small business, the one day reviews. That's any change of uses and any remodels under 6,000 square feet and some other things that might be where we were asked to look at it within one day. We will look at uh, those plans within one day for you, get your comments to you within one day. That's it. All right, thanks, Cody. So Bob's gonna now meet Casey Nettles in our pre-treatment team. So remember a few slides ago, Bob, needed to design his grease trap. And so now we're gonna go into the plan review phase on his grease trap. So what Dante didn't tell y'all is that this is the most exciting four slides that you're gonna see for this entire presentation. Not to take away from anybody else, but just be prepared. Um, so does Bob need a grease trap? Of course Bob needs a grease trap. He's doing food service. And so we do require those uh, facilities to have a grease trap. Um, a grease interceptor or a grease trap, we use that term interchangeably there. If you do look it up in the dictionary, there is a definition for trap versus interceptor. We just say trap because interceptor is a long word and it's scary. Um, so a grease trap will collect all of the fats, oils, and greases that go down the sink. Um, this is not your grease from fryers. The number one thing that we get told when we are doing these uh, plan reviews is we don't have fryers, we don't even fry food. And as I tell everybody, that's fantastic that you guys are healthy and that you're not frying food. Obviously, I like the fried food, but um, it's the stuff that you should be scraping into the trash cans, not the stuff that um, you're frying, because that fry grease goes elsewhere. So how should we size a grease trap? Um, years ago, we decided, the group decided, that we would put all of the different types of ways that you could come up with sizing for a grease trap on a wall, and we would throw darts at it, and whichever one we had the most darts on, that's the one we were gonna go with. So if you, and again, you can look at it, if you have 20 engineers in a room, you're gonna get 20 different ways to size a grease trap. So we had to pick one, and so we chose the, what's called the peak meals formula. Um, it's also, if you know the plumbing code, it's the uniform plumbing code appendix H. Um, what it looks at is your seating capacity and that's not your certificate of occupancy, how many people you can get in there standing shoulder to shoulder. It's gonna be how many seats you actually have and that's how we determine the grease trap. Um, so for Bob's, it looks like we're at about 3,300 square, or 3,300 gallons for a grease trap. Um, there is not going to be a grease trap that you can pull off the shelf that's 3,300 gallons and I think 3,375 is what it says. Um, you're not gonna be able to pull that off. So we offer a 20% wiggle room um, and really we go in increments of 500. So he can go up to a 3,500 gallon grease trap but we're also gonna approve a 3,000 gallon grease trap. And what else does Bob need to do in order to get approved? He's talked to Cody. Cody has said, um, here's your MEP or 
you know, you have your MEPs, fantastic, let's go through this. Um, so before I write approved on your plan uh, for your building permit or your change of occupancy, uh, Bob is gonna need to have a grease trap discharge permit application. Um, those applications are available online. You can email me directly. You can talk to any development staff. I think sometimes I hide them, like in City Hall. It's kind of like a, a seek and find out there. Um, so they're all over the place for you guys to have and fill out. Um, you can upload that application uh, either to Acela, which is what we're moving to, is having everything uploaded into Acela. You can email it directly to me. You can email it to anybody on my staff. You can hand it to somebody in development and say, I don't know what to do with this, and they're going to send it to me. Um, and then you'll have to pay the grease trap fee. And payments are completed. The easiest way to do this is to pay it online through the Acela system. Um, if you really wanna come and visit me, you can, and we will take check and money order there, but it's a lot easier to do it online through Acela um, or go down to that central cashier in the development downstairs, in the lower level of City Hall. Um, and all of this, all of the permitting stuff, the application, needs to be done after we approve the size of the grease trap. So if Bob came in here and said that he's gonna put in a 100 gallon grease trap and he's really excited about this 100 gallon grease trap, we're gonna turn around and say no that 100 gallon is not gonna work, you need to upsize it. So that's gonna be part of that time that it takes for um, Bob to get his building permit is based off of how long it takes him to come back and draw pictures that show a larger than a 100 gallon grease trap. Hand it on over. So Bob's got a permit that's just been approved and he's gonna go do his inspections. And he's gonna meet Susanna. Good afternoon, everybody. You guys learning stuff today? Yeah? Yeah, me too. And I work here. So uh, <laughs> we finally got a building permit, and it's issued. Seems like a long road to get to that point, right? We have a lot of different inspection types that Bob may need uh, during the bistro that we are building. We have a full list of them here. It's not all inclusive. He may have something special in his building. Uh, being that Bob has already completed his plan review process, he's already familiar with the codes that we use, that we inspect off the same ones that the plan reviewers work with. Um, in the city of Fort Worth, we currently have 33 inspection districts. We cover a lot of real estate. We have three different types of inspections, or excuse me, inspectors, and we were told earlier that Bob is not in a design district, so he's going to end up with a senior combination inspector. So he will have one inspector for all of his trades, building and his MEPs. Building inspections, these are the general ones that you will need um, during the course of Bob's project. If y'all are new to Fort Worth and building in Fort Worth, I highly, highly, highly suggest that you call in a stakeout inspection for your very first inspection. Um, you can meet, greet your inspector, ask questions, show him things you may have on your drawings that you're concerned with. It really can help resolve problems in the field. Um, mechanical. We have some generic uh, mechanical inspections. Um, one thing I do want to note, since Bob has a hood going in his restaurant, a type one, he's also going to need to get the fire department to come out and approve his hood before the mechanical can be finaled. Um, on electrical, same thing. We have pretty uh, generic list of inspections that you may need throughout your project. Um, the one thing to note that Fort Worth also does as far as inspections is temporary power. If you're trying to get your building energized so that you can test equipment uh, before the building is actually 100%. Um, plumbing, Ms. Casey just talked to us a little bit about plumbing. Uh, we do inspect the grease traps on my side of everything. So sometimes we have to bug Casey if we have a problem in the field with the grease trap. Uh, we also pretty much hold our plumbing finals hostage until you get your backflows completed through the water department. Uh, change of use, this is what we're gonna need if um, the dental office decides to stay, maybe. We'll see if we can pull a change of use permit. 
Um, if we have remodels that is involved with it, because we just left it as a shell, Bob's only doing his bistro, uh, we will need additional permits for the MEPs and inspections as well. Um, different types of certificates of occupancy. We have um, a few different ones. We can do an LCO prior to the completion of your building um, or a TCO. Uh, Bob's going to choose the LCO option for his bistro because he wants to get his health inspections completed and that's required for his health inspections to be finalized. So to get an LCO, um, they have to be pretty close. We can't just have open walls and wires hanging all over the place. The building has to be in a pretty close uh, point of construction. We normally do it for a 60-day time frame. There's a $300 fee. If you need an extension on an LCO, that also requires a $300 fee. Um, all of the MEPs either need to be in final approved status or they need to be okay for an LCO so that we have no safety issues on, in the building. Um, we also have to get the fire department involved because Bob's building is sprinkled. That requires all of that stuff to be approved prior to your building inspector coming out. We can do um, LCOs for furniture and fixtures. Bob needs to get his kitchen equipment stocked up in there, train his employees, that type of thing. So we have different options there. Um, our permanent CO, we're fine, we're final, we're done. We're ready to move into, landscaping's done, uh, a permanent address is posted on the building for emergency personnel and, and your customers as well. <laughs> All the trades and, and fire has been finaled out in Bob's building and he's ready to open at this point. Thanks. We're going to meet Stephanie Neff now so Bob can do his health inspections. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Stephanie Neff, and I am a senior inspector with the Consumer Health Division. Um, basically, it's a fancy way of saying the health department. So Bob's Bistro, does Bob's Bistro need a health review? Yes, Bob's Bistro needs a health review. So anytime you have any type of food, so Bob is gonna have open food, you know, he may be cooking food, preparing food, but we also um, do plan reviews for grocery stores, even if it's prepackaged, bars, cocktail lounges, anything you ingest is considered a food. So we would do a plan review on, uh, on that facility. So some just important things to um, start off with, a residence or home may not be used as a food establishment. So it does have to be a commercial property. We do not inspect home businesses in the consumer health division. Um, the location does have to be connected to city water and sewer, or um, it also has to meet state and local requirements. If you're connected to city water and sewer, you're already good to go, you already meet those requirements. Um, space for employees' belongings. So when we're doing these reviews, we really try to ensure that we're limiting the risk of foodborne illness. So during this plan review process, that's part of what we're doing is to eliminate that risk. So we wanna make sure those employees aren't storing like their drinks or beverages on food, food-related items. They're not throwing their jackets on food or food service containers. So we wanna make sure that they store their um, items in approved places. Um, Employees should have conveniently accessible restrooms. So conveniently accessible is kind of up to interpretation, but we do wanna be mindful. You know, if your employees are having to go out, you know, into another building where it may be raining, hailing, you know, I know we don't really see snow here, but if they're having to leave that and be exposed to all types of weather to get to the restroom, it's typically not conveniently accessible. So we wanna make sure that we take our employees into consideration. Um, customers may not go through the kitchen or food prep areas to access the restrooms. So the kitchens are sterile environments, as you could say, and they are only approved for individuals approved to be in the kitchen. So we cannot have customers going through the kitchen with a possible risk of contamination in order to get to the restroom. So you wanna make sure those restrooms are like in the dining room or public spaces. You can still have employee only restrooms back behind in the back of house, but you wanna make sure that you have easily accessible restrooms in consumer areas. 
So what is consumer health gonna look for? So the first thing that we are going to do is we're gonna ask you for a copy of the menu. So this way we can see exactly what type of food you're gonna be cooking. It's gonna give us an idea of how you're gonna prepare it, how you're gonna store it. So first thing, where is the food gonna enter in the building? Are you gonna use you know, the front door to bring in all of that food? Do you have a loading dock? Do you have a back door? How is that food actually gonna come into the establishment? Where is that food gonna be stored? So do you have sufficient refrigeration? So maybe Bob has a 10 page menu with like hundreds of menu items and he only has two little reach in coolers. We're gonna be like, hey Bob, that's not sufficient refrigeration for that amount of food product. So you're either gonna have to reduce your menu or you're gonna have to think about adding a walk-in cooler. You're gonna have to add a walk-in freezer. Because remember again, we're trying to protect against foodborne illness. And if we have food sitting out at room temperature, we're not protecting against foodborne illness. How will food be cooked or prepared? So is he gonna cook it in the oven? Does he have fryers? If, if that's the case, he's gonna need a vent hood system. Um, preparing, so is he gonna thaw large quantities of meat? You know, does he need a food preparation sink in order to thaw all of that food? Um, does he need to be able to wash produce, so wash his vegetables, wash his fruits, um, any of that? Um, how will food leave the kitchen and be served to the public? So after we prepare it, how are we taking out to the guests? Are we passing it through a serving window? Um, are the employees having to walk all the way around the kitchen in order to get to the dining room? Are you going to have any salad bars or customer self-service bars, um, salsa bars? You know, maybe we need a sneeze guard in order to protect that food. And then how are dirty dishes washed and cleaned and stored? So after those servers bust those tables, how are they bringing that back into the kitchen? How are they dropping off those dirty dishes to you know, reduce contamination? How are we taking out the trash? Where is that trash being stored? Where's your dumpsters gonna be located? So that's the first thing that we kind of do is we kind of assess the whole scope of the restaurant and kind of do a walkthrough and make sure it's conveniently accessible. So consumer health will need your full scope of plans. So we do request your MEP, so um, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. We do request your equipment schedule, your finished schedule, and then, like I said, a copy of the menu. So the equipment schedule is gonna help us determine that you do have sufficient equipment for your operations. Do you have enough reach-in coolers? Do you have a walk-in? Do you have a freezer? Um, is your equipment commercial? So. Bob's Bistro is a commercial property, commercial business. He is not allowed to use any residential type equipment. So he can't go to like Walmart or Home Depot and go buy a stove. He has to make sure it's commercial equipment. Um, refrigerators, microwaves, all of that does have to be NSF approved. Um, we'll talk a little bit about finished schedule in a minute. Um, so one of the other main things, if there are any alterations to the approved plans, consumer health does need to be notified. So if for any reason Bob wants to modify his restaurant and move some things after consumer health has already approved it, definitely let us know. Um, sometimes this happens and then consumer health comes in and it may result in construction delays or denied issuance of a health permit because that was not built to what was approved and so we may not be able to issue a health permit if that's the case. And then, um, like Susie said, so certificate of occupancy must be obtained before a health permit is issued. I would definitely write that down. Your certificate of occupancy is not contingent upon health inspections. We are the very last step. So once you get your CO is when health will come in and give you your health permit. It's a little bit different than other cities, especially in DFW. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the facility itself. So what are some of the standards for floors, walls, and ceilings? So some of the main things, smooth, easily cleanable, non-absorbent, light in color. So we're gonna say that multiple times throughout the whole planning process. Smooth, easy to clean, light in color, non-absorbent. So we wanna make sure that those are installed in all of those areas. So sometimes I've been told, you didn't tell me I had to install a ceiling. I didn't think I had to imply that you needed a ceiling in your restaurant. So they do have to be installed in your facility. Um, consumer areas such as dining rooms um, don't need to meet this requirement as long as they're kept clean. So you can go crazy in your dining room, you can put up all kinds of decorations, plants, whatever you wanna do as long as it's kept clean, you know, we don't have too many restrictions on that. Studs, joists, and rafters may not be exposed in areas subject to moisture. 
Um, and so those ceilings are required in kitchens, service stations, bars, restrooms. So you wanna make sure that you have those drop down ceilings in there. Moisture, what does it create? Mold, you know, we wanna make sure that those, you know, we're keeping the construction integrity and making sure that they're kept clean. Carpeting, so <laughs> carpeting is not permitted in food preparation areas, restrooms, garbage areas, or any areas subject to moisture. I just did a pre-operational inspection about two weeks ago and they decided to put carpeting in the restrooms. That is a big no-no. I don't know why they did that. Uh, yeah, I, know. I have photos. It's on the ceiling, actually. It's not even on the floors. Um, so no carpet, you know, dining room, okay, but any other areas, no carpet. And then exposed utility lines and pipes may not be installed on the floor. We don't wanna create any tripping hazards, so always make sure that they're down below or located inside of the walls. So some of the plumbing standards that we need to achieve, so hand washing sinks. So we talked about you know, reducing that risk for foodborne illness. So we wanna make sure that those hand washing sinks are located within every 15 feet of food preparation, food service, um, dish washing, so wherever you're washing your dishes and inside of restrooms. And we talked about conveniently located. Um, so something may be within 15 feet, but if you're having to go through a doorway or if those employees are not able to see that hand sink, it's not conveniently accessible. So again, that's where that flow kind of comes into play. So we're gonna see how the employees are taking the food out, how they're bringing in dirty dishes. After they drop off those dirty dishes, are they able to wash their hands so they're not touching food and recontaminating all of that food? Okay, three compartment sink. So all establishments are required to have a three compartment sink. So your restaurants, your bars, snack bars, um, even our food trucks and little you know, hot dog push carts. All of those have three compartment sinks to wash, rinse and sanitize your dishes. Um, you do wanna make sure that they are large enough to put your largest piece of equipment in because you do have to submerge it in order to sanitize it. So you wanna make sure that those are sufficient for your operations. You are required to have a mop sink or a utility sink. And this is basically, you know, to mop your floors and dispose of that mop water. And then also a food preparation sink may be required to wash produce or thaw meat. So again, that's where that menu comes into place. So not all facilities are required to have a food preparation sink, but I would say probably about 80% of them are required to. Okay, so more plumbing standards. So backflow prevention. So this can be achieved a couple different ways. Um, so one of the main ways that we see um, are indirect connections from the plumbing. So basically it's like a floor drain and that's a, it's a really good photo right there. And then you have that piping. So if you have any sewage or wastewater backup, I think we all remember like Snowmageddon back in 2021 when all those pipes burst and all that water went everywhere. So when that happens, we want that wastewater to be able to go out on the floor. We don't want it to go up and contaminate like our ice machines, um, food prep, so if we have any food thawing in those food prep sinks or if we're washing dishes, we don't want that wastewater to contaminate those items. Um, so I'm gonna piggyback, piggyback a little bit off of um, Casey with grease traps. So consumer health, our ordinance does require grease traps to be located outside. So grease trap, show your plumbing and show that that grease trap is located outside. We do not allow for the indoor installation of grease traps. Um, hot water heaters. So we just wanna make sure that your hot waters are sufficient for peak demands. So we have seen an increase in tankless water heaters, you know, which is great, you know, go green. However, a lot of them aren't sufficient for commercial operations. So you wanna make sure that that tankless water heater is able to support your three compartment sink, your hand sinks, your mop sink, your prep sink, if Bob has a bar in his bistro, it also has to you know, supply hot water to that bar. So a lot of those tankless water heaters, commercial operations are gonna put in probably like two, sometimes three tankless water heaters to make sure that they have hot water at all times. And then floor drains should be provided for cleaning purposes. So that way when you mop your floors or whenever you scrub them, squeegee them, all of that wastewater goes into the floor drains. So there are some options for variances within the consumer health department. Um, so probably one of the most popular ones that we're seeing right now are outer openings. Have y'all seen like those garage doors um, or those doors or windows that are designed to be left open, like indoor, outdoor dining? 
Yeah, so we're seeing a lot of that now. So that is okay as long as it's with a variance request. Um, but part of that variance request is that your kitchen has to be completely enclosed. So if Bob has those outer openings, he cannot have an open kitchen. He cannot have any pass-through windows or anything like that. So he has to install doors with like weather stripping around it and make sure that that kitchen is completely enclosed. This is gonna help to ensure, you know, we don't have any pests that come into the kitchen. If you have any birds that may fly in, we don't want them into the kitchen as well. Um, three compartment sink variants. So this is typically only used in a bar that is in conjunction with a restaurant. So the bar itself may only have a mechanical dishwasher and a hand sink, um, but the kitchen has a three compartment sink. So that way if that mechanical dishwasher is ever not working or it breaks, you still have another way to wash your dishes. So restaurants, you cannot apply for this variance that will not be granted. Restaurants have to have a three compartment sink, but bars in correlation with a restaurant may be able to apply for that. Um, okay, next. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some of the inspections. So consumer health typically will do a pre-operational inspection about seven to 10 days before construction is scheduled to end. So you just give us a call, let us know your location. We'll come out and do a pre-op. We still like for the contractors to be on site. So if there um, are anything like any items that need to be brought into compliance, you're able to still do that with your contractors there. And then the final inspection is conducted once the certificate of occupancy is obtained. So like Susie said, um, you know, you are uh, um, able to apply for an LCO, that limited certificate of occupancy. Consumer health either has to have the final certificate of occupancy or an LCO to occupy before we can issue a health permit. So LCO to occupy or the final CO before the health permit will be issued. Um, your health permit does have to be issued before you are able to operate um, and serve food to the general public. Once you get that health permit, then you are good to go on our end. Okay. And I think that's it. Bob is done, everybody. So that's part three and of course the end, but let's do some more Q&A. By raise of hands, who has questions on part three? Don't be shy. <laughs> Nothing on part three? Okay, right there. Uh, is there any permit required from the city for ETJ land? Say it one more time, sir. If it's a zoning is ETJ for that land, anything required from the city? So for grease traps, for grease traps, we don't require uh, ETJ to be permitted. Uh, not just grease trap for the whole permit, like okay. for the construction permit. Yes, you will need building permits in the ETJ. For the ETJ, okay. Ready? If there's a discrepancy between the ad, making an address, basically calculating it counterclockwise or clockwise, we've had an issue before where PS said, said one thing, uh, fire department said another. I'm assuming that the direction that the fire department is mandating takes precedence. We are the authority having jurisdiction for addresses. And, and that includes all five counties that the city is in. And the post office recognizes that. I re recall once they tried not to, but we got it all straightened out. Got it. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hey, um, just to clarify the ETJ question, sir. Um, so basically, the county handles permitting in ETJ, and that includes drainage and other things related to that permit. We do platting, so subdivisions in the ETJ. Yes, hello. Uh, specifically on grease traps, is there a list of um, uses that require specific, like obviously for food, but for instance, uh, if they're doing smoothies, is there a list or is that just something we need to contact you about so specifically? We so we have a guidance document that's also on the city's website that you can pull up and that might help you out a little bit. 
Um, but the, the general rule of thumb is if there is food happening and it is not in a pre-packaged, like a novelty ice cream or a single serve breakfast burrito, you're going to need to talk to grease traps. Um, and you will likely need to have a grease trap. Also secondary rule of thumb. If you're going to talk to Stephanie with consumer health, you're going to talk to us, uh, with grease traps as well. Okay. And secondly, um, grandfather, are grease traps grandfathered? Can they be? How does that work? So no, um, the the idea behind that, or not the idea, but the um, the way we operate is if you have a grease trap right now, and let's say we say it's undersized, you are welcome to keep that grease trap, and we will allow you to use that until you have a change of ownership, until you change out your kitchen kitchen equi equipment, if you increase your seating capacity significantly or if we have a sanitary sewer overflow that we can link back to you. So those are our triggering mechanisms to get you into compliance. Change of ownership for the the business operating out of it or for the- Yes, for the actual business. We permit the business that is discharging into the grease trap. So essentially the tenant, um, the owner right. could be ABC rentals, um, but if it's, it's whomever is in that building operating. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right in the middle. I've heard the mayor speak super high about the new city hall. And after seeing this process laid out, I can see how being in a new space will be super beneficial, not only from consumer perspective, but for you guys too. Are you guys excited to be in the new city hall eventually? We're very, we're very excited. Did. Yeah. That's part of our one-stop shop. Exactly. Which it's going to be super helpful especially after seeing all the nitty gritty of all this. So I myself am super excited as well. Just to follow up, we are, not we are not located in City Hall. So Consumer Health, we have our own office that we operate out of. So we will not be at City Hall. And we are not currently at City Hall. Nor is Grease Traps. And we will not be moving. Um, but we can see City Hall from our building. So y'all can wave to us while you're there. Okay, so we're the oddball group because the inspectors are not at City Hall either. <laughs> okay. We are. <laughs> um, I have a. I, I have. I just want to say, City Hall is lucky size. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a, actually I have a couple of questions. It seems like the X team is a really good way to move development forward quickly. Is there any plan to like expand that or just, it seems like that would make things really efficient. Um, so is there any plan to expand that or figure out how to work that into different like high need areas um, for development? So, yeah. So if the more work we get, the more people are interested in using the X team, then obviously yes, we would expand it, yes. Right now we have one team, but we would love to have two, three, four, however many. The more people we get to use it, the better. And then my second question is, you mentioned on the inspectors that, or what you said sounded like you have one inspector, so meet them, that kind of thing. But we've had a, had situations where um, partners have built something, had an inspector out to inspect it, said no, here's how you fix it. And then a different inspector comes on and it's like, oh no, actually that's not right. And it's like, wait, but the other inspector came out and said it was, I had to fix it like this, and now you're saying it's wrong, so we're just in this loop of like, different inspectors expecting different things? First of all, I'm really sorry to hear that that happened on your project. Um, and second of all, just to let you guys know, that's technically what I do now. We started up a new training program for all the inspectors so that everybody is on the same page across the city because that helps y'all down the road. Uh, Jerry Barton, do we still have private inspection companies that do that where you just have to deal with one inspector and pay them to do it? Yes, sir. How does that work? We have a third party inspection program in Fort Worth and um, they are registered different companies that are only a few are allowed to work in the city. Uh, we require them to be certified just like our inspectors are. Um, I can't guarantee you would only have one inspector if you were to use a third-party company. 
Um, you would also be required to have a city inspection as a follow-up to your final inspection, even if you use a third-party company. So. Okay. And then I just wanted to follow up. Health would not be included in that. Yes, yeah, so you would have to contact health department. So on the flip side of uh, grease traps, uh, clear water discharge, is there any special requirements regarding if the industrial side is discharging a lot of clear water? I know that can mess up with sanitary sewer uh, treatment. Absolutely. So um, for any industrial facility, um, we assess that. We have a different team that will assess that to see if we need industrial pretreatment. Um, and so if there is a lot of clear water discharge, they will go through and figure out what we need to make sure that we're hitting our local limits for that discharge. Okay. So is that pretreatment done on site then of that industrial site? Yes. That okay. pretreatment would be done on site okay. and it would be done by the facility. Okay. Thank you. Hi. For the X team services, does that apply to commercial and residential applications? Yes. Okay. So if you want to build a house and have the X team look at it, yeah. Anything else for Q and A on part three? What about the whole process? So we went through two sections. More Q and A on the process. Right there. Hey, Charles Page with Bowler. I just had a question. I know you mentioned the grading permit if it's one acre or more, I think, right? And then the IPRC for the infrastructure. As far as the site, I'm a civil engineer, so I'm asking this, but as far as the site plan approval, is that pretty linked up with building process or is it just IPRC and grading permit? What's like the actual site, full site development permit um, encapsulated by, if that makes sense? So you're I think your question specifically is just if there's like one site plan for all that. Or what's the what's the permit that allows you to fully build out the full site permit? If that's makes any sense for for the uh, outside of the building. Oh, so site improvements. Site improvements, yes. So th it's a combination of what you're getting through IPRC and grading. So it's, it's not one site permit because we don't have those. Anything else? What else about the whole process? We went through a ton of information today. We want to go over as much as we can today. So the funny thing is we do, <laughs> right? So we on our website and potentially- I, I can we'll, speak to this right now. Okay, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. So, we, yeah we, so we have those. We are updating them right now. We have most of them updated right now. Now you're talking about the master. That one we're looking to roll out next week, but we have all these individual processes that are being updated right now. So if you go to the pre-development website, you will see these processes in a tab and you can start uh, doing the roadmap on your processes. And additionally, one thing that Jennifer mentioned earlier or somebody mentioned earlier, right, that was the original vote version. So 2.0 is the CFW permit assist, right, where like uh, the, these process maps are intended to give you general process diagrams, right, from one to another. And it's interactive, right, so it's very informative. But, you know, the CFW permit assist is specific to your track. One thing we know about real estate is there's, there's, there's no two pieces of land that are exactly alike, right? And so the, the entitlement, right, the drainage, all those things are going to be different from site to site. So if you utilize the permit assist, put in your specific information, it can spit out project-specific information. It also emails you a PDF of all the requirements for the site. So you can work with your client on each bullet point. And um, the team is also working currently to tie that to our permitting system. So it'll spit out all the permits you need, how much it costs, the time that it takes, right? And then next, the next phase is, it's gonna also apply for them for you, 
right? So, you know, that's going to be more to come in the future. I want to ask about the backflow valves, the RPZs. Uh, we have to put one outside in the main where the water comes in, but then we need one for the Coke machine. We need one for the ice machine. We need one at the bar for the bar gun. We need, like, why so many if we have a main one? So the, the RPZ valves, um, I don't handle backflow, but I know just enough to be dangerous. Um, so the RPZ valves, what they do, um, what Stephanie touched on was they keep the yucky water from getting back into the system. So if you think about it from a food handling perspective, okay, we don't want the yucky water getting into thawed food, into the sinks, that kind of stuff. But if you think about it from a whole city perspective, a sanitary sewer and a drinking water perspective, if you have a problem and on your soda machine gun and it goes, and we send carbonated water back into the city's uh, drinking water and then it goes to a daycare and the daycare kids are now drinking your carbonated water from your soda gun that's not the level the standard that we are required to keep for our service water for the city of Fort Worth that, that I understand okay. but then why do we have the main one though isn't that the job of the main RPZ Part of it is the plumbing code, and part of it is also our plumbing ordinance. Um, you really need to check with your inspector that's actually handled through the water department, not um, us up here. So I would really talk with your water inspector and, and see what he's going to require you on each individual appliance. And that would be Steve Fulkerson with Backflow. He does all the plan reviews. Um, so you can contact him. And then the inspections are typically done in the Backflow group by some of our other inspectors. I think you all had mentioned the same day change of use. Is, is, was that correct? Is that what I heard? Is that new or is, that, is there something that you have to do special to apply for that? Or is that automated through the system now? So it's new. Um, and there's nothing really special you have to do. Um, we, me and the other plant exam supervisor, we just kind of go th every morning and look and find them and send it off to our exam team that does the one days and the walk-ins. And that's just based on square footage? The change of use is not. The remodels are. The change of use is basically um, the reviewer will look at it and say, yes, I can do this in a day. And if he can't, then he said, okay, this will go in the normal queue because, you know, I don't know, you're changing a mall to a hospital that's not going to be a, a one day type thing so, thank you yeah. in the back do you, get if you are on, do you get notified if you're on the one day review or not or is that just something that you guys see on your end so it's just something we do on our end but i mean you'll so once you submit the permit and it goes through customer service obviously if you submitted everything they'll send it to my team um, you should get it within 24 hours. If you get something within 24 hours, you know you're in the one day. If you don't, then you don't. I, I've got a change of use question as well. I've, I've got, so we own some direct office buildings and like you'll have tenants, their leases roll and you get a new tenant in there and it's like, okay, this was an office tenant and now we have an office tenant. So it's like, why, it, why do I have to do this change of use? And I, maybe it's a terminology thing, but it, it has been very confusing for me in the past. So I'm trying to get CEOs, so maybe you could speak to that a little bit. So there's a difference between a change of there's a difference between use and ordinance. In the building code, we have ordinances or not ordinances. I'm sorry, occupancies. So a B occupancy is a B occupancy to us. It's not a big deal. For zoning, I don't know if anybody's zoning here. There's difference uh, of use. So you might be a B office, and that's the same occupancy based on the building code. But you might be go to a medical office, which is a different use the zoning, and that's why you have a change of use. What we see most of with office to office, I think you're talking about same use to same use, right? What we see most of, and this is the perfect segue for me to say this, whenever you have a tenant and that tenant's get ready to move out, keep that CO, right? Guard it with your life. Because that's what tells us in our fire department, we don't have to get a new plan set that shows us where all the exits are and all these things are. It shows us that we've expect, inspected it. The fire and the building official have approved it. And all we're doing is a name change for your next tenant. 
Without that, we have to go through a, a long, drawn-out process to kind of prove up that space is habitable and, and safe for your, your, uh, your eventual end users. What other questions do we have? One thing I'll know is, you know, we've mentioned our review timeline. So our commercial development guide, in addition to our website, has those posted. And so that will help with project planning as well. And that was the document referred to earlier. And that is also found, again, on our development services webpage. Question in the middle. Y'all mentioned a newsletter that y'all send out that goes over kind of the analytics of timelines on projects and new developments. Do we have to sign up for that, like with our email, or how do we get that sent to us? So we misspoke. That newsletter is not sent out, but it's available on our website. So every month we report um, our statistics. It's a 17-page report, the development activity report, and, um, and we call it the DAC because it's for the Development Advisory Committee. Anyway, lots of acronyms. Um, but it is on the website. We post it every month. So right now, this week, the team is pulling together all the information for April and building our report. Um, it includes things in there like um, total number of different types of permits, so single family, industrial, educational, um, it includes information on where that activity is happening. So it's got heat maps in there um, to say where those permits are, are being pulled from. Um, it also includes information on our building, our, our business process improvement initiatives, where we try to make things better, faster, funner for um, all of y'all and for all of us too. Um, so it's a, a really great resource, but it is available on the website. Um, it, again, it gets published every month. It also goes to council. So if you don't catch it um, on the website, if you ever you know, have time on your hands and want to watch a work session. Um, the city council also gets that report um, covered by an informal report, which is sort of like a cover letter, um, which has a summary of what's in the main report. So that is available on the website. I have one more thing. Uh, Jennifer was talking about funner, faster, and better. We've been talking about new stuff that we're doing. The inspectors are doing FaceTime inspections now. Get a hold of their phone number. If it's something simple, there's certain things they can't, so there's certain things they do that can save y'all time on your job sites. Call them, they all have iPhones. What other questions do we have? Well, if we don't have questions, let's figure out what we're going to do next. So again, your handout, you've got a QR code. So we want to hear what was discussed today and, and figure out what is helpful, what needs to be discussed in the future, so we can make the next workshop applicable to what is the highest demand for our audience today. So is there anything on wrap up you'd like to go over? like? Maybe just a couple ideas from the crowd right now on what you'd like to see in the next workshop. Don't be shy, y'all. We're doing this because we love it. On the far right. So yeah, maybe maybe more tailored to the product type like you're saying. So a bigger project that's going to have maybe some different tangibles than a small bistro site. Okay. Yeah. Uh, going off that, I feel like maybe one of the sessions uh, somewhere in the middle of your three sessions, maybe it could be a breakout session. It's like, all right, if you're an industrial, you go over here. If you're a uh, restaurant, you're over here. And you, you could kind of hammer through some of those specifics would be with just your group because you get a lot of really informative questions that get asked in those things. So, mm -hmm. IPRC process. I uh, also like to hear like uh, what, how is the zoning change process? So maybe in the future you can go more details if you want to go to the zoning change. 
So if you had a property that wasn't zoned appropriately, how do you go through the zoning change correct. process? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Platting. Okay. So I'm hearing we've got more product specific, but also process specific. So we could look at each one of these processes and do a breakout for just that, but then we could also do another for different project types. Couple more hands. Yeah. I think it would be cool to see a mock pre-development conference kind of done out on stage in front of us and something. Okay. Like that. Yeah. Also to expand upon the, the zoning change, so a couple of different examples on that and when it makes sense to do a zone change or a PD or a special use permit. So I think we could have a more comprehensive overview on everything zoning. That's what it sounds like. So we could do zoning change and get down into even the change of use aspect because there's zoning it tailored into that. So we could focus in on zoning for a specific workshop. All right. I think also like having a list of like options, like if you're dealing with this type of project, you know, we can have um, miscellaneous projects, express CFA, normal IPRC process. So just giving us like, these are the options that your project can go to and then figuring out this is um, the best for this use or vice versa, so. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, and to expand on that, if we could just kind of get maybe an understanding of what needs to be submitted at what stage in the process. Um, I mean, the civil engineering site plan means something different in every single city. So just kind of getting an understanding of what site plan means and kind of when civil engineering drawings need to be submitted and how that gets caught in the process. I know earlier we said that there's the grading permit and the IPRC and there's not really a site permit. If we could just kind of get an understanding of how all the disciplines work together on public versus private versus building and kind of how all of that works together and when you need uh, what engineering plans from us and, and kind of what stage in the process. Okay, so public versus private, when to submit civils at the different phases of, the, of our development process. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, one other thing, right, uh, and I've got my lawyer here to kick me if I say anything wrong, but um, we're going through some changes, right? There's a bunch of bills in the legislature that may change the way we do business. So to answer your question, what do we do and when, what's submitted, how and when, and who do you submit it to, that may all change June 1st, right? I mean, there, there's several bills that are directly related to uh, streamlining development. Some are gonna, you're gonna see positive things from. Some, maybe not so much, right? Because legislators, what they don't do is go to development one-on-ones, right? <laughs> and so, so they sometimes have good intent 
and sometimes it'll have an adverse effect on the way our developers and community partners develop property. Um, and so whatever the result of the, the, um, the legislative session, we're going to have to uh, reshuffle the deck a bit on our processes. The good news and the main reason why I stand before you to say this is one thing about the city of Fort Worth is we believe in participation. We, we believe in stakeholder engagement and mainly it's called the voice of customer. So as we react to these new state laws, we'll have to build a new process but we want to hear from our customers and work through it together. So I mentioned when I came up at the first time, uh, real estate council development um, advisory committee, uh, there's the builders association and uh, ACEC and a bunch of other, you know, uh, professional organizations that work with us on our processes. Anytime we make a change in the city of Fort Worth, right? So it's not a bunch of planners and engineers back like, Oh, what are we going to do? No, it's really, we want to be engaging and we want to understand from the customer side of the house, how best to facilitate development. So I say all that's to say, be on the lookout for like, we've got all your contact information now. So when we look to change our processes, if you guys want to be on that committee, or if you guys want to have input in how we develop our, our process in the city of Fort Worth, you know, answer that call when it comes to you, because we'd love to have your input and support on, you know, what we eventually do to make our process better. Yeah, and what, you know, one thing I'm thinking about, too, is we're talking about timelines and, you know, helping pinpoint stuff before submittals come in is, you know, we've got a few different options on these different phases where you can do a PDC at the very beginning, and you're going to learn all the different items from beginning to end of what you should be looking for. We also do the pre-submittals for stormwater. And then you can do pre-submittal for IPRC as well. So some of these pre-meetings, they are helpful to help point out what you should be looking for before you even make a submittal. So that that's one way we can definitely step in. And then again, we want to we want to talk to y'all in person. So don't think you need a meeting just to talk to us. You can call us. Hence, you know, we've got all of the all these people you saw on the stage this link here for the staff contact, you're going to be able to pull down by name and you can find me, Dante, you can find Ty, you can find Shad, you can find everybody. You can find us, call us and walk through these questions even before you do a, a PDC or you make any formal submittal. So we can game plan and troubleshoot before you drop that into a cella. Hey, sorry, this is basically recapping what was just been asked um, and kind of what I mentioned earlier, but you know, after the land, the use or, you know, rezoning or whatever, the zoning process is kind of nailed down if, if changes have to happen. A any way that you can kind of split apart and just keep the lines clear between building permit and site permit. The reason I asked the question earlier is uh, when I've done permitting in the southeast, you know, they literally hand you your site development permit card. And so that that's kind of what I had in mind when I asked that question. So any way that you can um, kind of help split that up maybe in the future, I think would be helpful. I think for developers, a lot of times the, the pressure and the timeline gets put on getting that those site development aspect pieces of the of the of the puzzle or of the permit shouldn't be a puzzle. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the site bu and building, you know, it's it's it's, uh, it's the walls and everything is a little more clear cut. So any way that the uh, site development can kind of be split apart and clarified. I think is helpful if that makes sense. What else? We, we, we definitely have this space longer. We want to figure out what's going on so we can make this better. Not only the processes, but your projects. Nothing else? Well, oh, go ahead. For a site that needs to be rezoned, um, what documents would you need? And would you say that 
the rezoning with the same plans, moving forward with the pre-development conference, if that would kind of already have the city aware of what the site's gonna look like as far as the site plan to get it rezoned? Do you think that's more, um, you know, direct to move forward with the pre-development conference with the same site plan and uh, vision? So do you mean the site plan you submit for the zoning change, you bring that to the PDC? Correct, yeah, with the same vision to get it rezoned, to get it developed, you know, the same um, intentions to get it rezoned with that same uh, site plan. Now, I guess in, in the way you're showing this, or you think it'd go to PDC first, figure out the zoning change, and then the zoning change? Right. Or? So, so for this scenario, we have 3.4 acres that we're going to need to rezone to uh, B for duplex. Mm -hmm. And to get it rezoned, we were going to go ahead and already have um, the concept plan and already have an architect kind of give us a layout of uh, duplex. That's our, our initial plan is to do um, 22 duplexes on that site. So for something like that, if we were to, you know, already have those plans beforehand for the rezoning to have better chances of getting the rezoning approved, um, we could still use that moving forward, right, for the pre-development conference. Oh, and yeah, absolutely. All the information. Yeah, the more information you can show us, the better. Right. Okay. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we can take hand drawings if we need to, but sounds like you have a, a very well thought out document already. Right. Absolutely bring that to a PDC. Okay. I know we've had people sneak out. Is there anything else? Well, I want to thank staff that put all their content into this slides. This was a lot of work. So give a round of applause to them. But as Jennifer mentioned, you know, everything we just went over, please put that into the survey. This will help us again program these ideas for the next workshop. So it is, it's meeting something that you really need. Anything else? All right, that's it. Thanks, everybody. Hey, let's give a round of applause for Dante, our host, before we go.